written permission of the sponsor is prohibited. Uh, just a few hours ago, we concluded our uh, one of our webinars for today, and that's still available down on the link um, on COVID-19 dental FAQs. Um, this COVID thing is really uh, affecting our practices. Uh, basically, you're going to be able to see our discussion there. And of course, this coming uh, Tuesday, we're going to have Dr. Paolo, uh, one of our people in the command center, uh, talking about virtual reality and treatment outcomes, something very interesting you can look forward to. Um, so uh, again, Botched is a orthodontic damage control lecture series on orthodontic screw-up cases. The case scenarios in these presentations, whether it be diagnostic or mechanical, are of or may have been sought for consult from the speakers. So more than the solutions, we would like to share the skills to detect and the thought processes involved in managing these Dr. Powell, situations. Yep. You need you need to go a little slow. Little your American, slow your, your, your American your American accent is gonna be a little hard for us. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nowhere in an American accent. Okay. It's okay. A, a Filipino American <laughs> whatever it is. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so again, um, Dr. Alice uh, uh, showed us this classification of orthodontic screw-ups on technical screw-ups and also non-technical screw-ups. So for today, we want to concentrate more on the technical screw-ups again. So technical screw-ups may be a variety of botch scenarios that are related to the investigative diagnostic procedures, critical thinking process, or the treatment mechanics, and thereby affecting the treatment outcomes. So... Uh, on the title vertical delusion, let's just explain what delusion is, because uh, this is some this is a word that is uh, kind of makes some people uncomfortable because it's typically a symptom or a mental disorder. I mean, a symptom of a mental disorder. But let's look at it and uh, how it's uh, defined. So, a delusion is an idiosyncratic belief or impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what is generally accepted as reality or rational argument. Oops, all right. So in vertical delusion, we would like to talk about idiosyncratic impressions we tend to have when we visualize vertically challenged orthodontic cases and how we ought to look at them from a rational argument. So Adit and I would love to give you a rational argument. We want to make you think. Last, um, last session, last episode, we, we kind of made people think. We kind of make them look back at their books and study more about TMJs, which is a good thing. And absolutely. right now, what I mean, want uh, to see... last time, last time was absolutely an eye opener for for a lot of people. Uh, that was actually another dimension altogether into diagnosis, and and people people never used to diagnose cases in that way. So I've got a lot of positive reviews on that, and yeah, even me, I think I'll need to buy that book and get on to how to identify TMJ issues first of all to begin with, <laughs> to know that they they're actually there. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Um, so today we want this uh, topic again to be an eye opener from a different perspective and this one is kind of very tricky because uh, vertical delusions, it, it's very easy to be uh, mistaken, it's very easy to, uh, to lose your focus or um, concentrate on what is rational because we see a lot of perspectives when we look inside the mouth. Like for example, we have here aesthetic and functional. Uh, so we're going to go into um, some topics on this and when we talk about high gingival smiles for example, when we look at patients and who have high gingival smiles, what do we assess? Do we assess the smiles or do we assess the patient in their vertical re um, relation or vertical rest position? The difference is that if you uh, assess your patient in a vertical rest position, is that you see the exposure of the lips. You, I mean, you see the exposure of the incisors, which would be aesthetic, another perspective of what is aesthetic. So if you intrude, just because you base it on the smiles, then you might have botched up that case. So these are the things that we want to look into. Same for functional. We look into mandibular rotations and what a simple kind of leveling alignment could affect the occlusal plane and also the maxillomandibular relationship. I think that's a very third, important topic. Yeah. And also uh, vertical anchorage delusions where um, I think you know, when in, in my teaching career, uh, which is very short, when I talk to people and I tell them to like intrude, some people would like to intrude. Can I intrude this with a wire bending? Can I intrude this with bracket positioning? And this is what, what we want to do is we want to shed light on what is supposed to be for each case that we would look at. So let's jump right into it. Yeah. So aesthetic delusions, um, diagnostic concept. We want to break this topic into a diagnostic concept of macro, mini, and micro aesthetics. 
high gingival smiles, and also occlusal cant. Dr. Addis would talk about the latter two, and I'll be talking about the first two. I'll be showing a little bit of some of my cases as well, but again, what we want to do is to make you think. So let's go. Um, in, in my group, what we teach is uh, one of the concepts that I pulled out of, uh, of, of profit of, of the uh, contemporary orthodontics. And what we have here is the difference of macroesthetics, mini aesthetics, and microesthetics. Now, this is something that is not really different to us as dentists. But sometimes we don't, we, we, uh, we feel like this is actually different to us when it comes to uh, focusing on the teeth. Now, what we usually uh, focus on the microesthetics where we want to fix the teeth in relation to one another. And we usually show the before and after, you know, when we're showcasing our case, we usually show the before and after within the, the mouth, which doesn't really reflect what aesthetics is really about. So you can fix the teeth according to one another. That's the easiest part. You just place the brackets, place the wire, change the elastics every month, and boom, you're going to get the straight occlusal plane. Question is, is your occlusal plane in the correct relationship with one another or a uh, correct relationship with your basal bone to, um, to allow you to exhibit a proper maxillomandibular relationship? Now, the thing that we don't really look in when it comes to the vertical relationship is the mini aesthetics and macro aesthetics. The mini aesthetics and macro aesthetics will be dealing with more of the whole face in a sense. And, and when you look at the mini aesthetics, this really concentrates particularly with the lower third of the face. And most of it just revolves around there. And um, so and it, it's something like this. Yeah, uh, I mean, we as orthodontists, we as orthodontists usually are capable of changing the lower third of the face more than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And that's how that that's just representative of how movable the mandible is. And um and for some people they think actually that you can't remodel the the mandible, which I can't personally agree with because actually uh and it doesn't matter how old you are, you will still adopt your jaw, your condyles would always adopt to the uh existent occlusion that you have. Um, and, and that basically happens in the context of remodeling. So if you're going to tell me that uh, anatomical changes are not possible, then what you're also telling is telling is uh, remodeling is not possible. And I think remodeling is the particular thing that we are depending on when it comes to moving teeth. And also, of course, macroesthetics, where we want to relate the whole mouth in relation to the whole face, what's happening to my... Oh, hold on. All right. There you go. Uh, which you want to relate the, the mouth to the whole face and make it really um, look good, make your patient look young. And, and if you want to impact your patient when it comes to a vertical, uh, when it comes to a, um, an impactful kind of sense, it's the vertical for me, if you're going to ask me, that really speaks, speaks aloud um, on, on what you have to do. So let's just go a little bit into it. So um, profit, this actually is just pulled out from the book, all right? So I'm not saying anything that's new. Uh, this all comes from uh, contemporary orthodontics by uh, Dr. Profit. So um, mac micro aesthetics, which we usually focus on, is enhancing the appearance of teeth, like reshaping orthodontic preparations and gingival recontouring. And basically for this one, it's really all about leveling alignment, placing the brackets, um, placing your molar bands or buckle tubes, placing the wire, changing elastics, and basically you're move, making the teeth move uh, according to the uh, relationship of one another. And um, so the other things that we address in this situation is the reshaping, uh, fixing minor traumas, straightening in, out the teeth, coming up with mammalons. You know, whenever I show people this, uh, this um, infographic here, they, they suddenly bring out their phones and they take, take pictures of it. But then, um, and the reason why is because they're so focused on what's going to go inside the mouth that actually you can't just look at patients and say, oh, that patient was treated with an MBT. Oh, that patient was treated with an edgewise. That patient was treated with a Ross. And the reason why and studies have proven that a difference of about three to five degrees in terms of its uh, tips, torques, and angulation doesn't really make a difference in terms of what the patient would look like. So it does, does it really matter what type of bracket system you follow? Does it really matter in terms of what <clears throat> torques you're using? So um, other things that uh, would be would follow here would be the um, restorations or remodeling of your teeth, like caninizations or lateralizations. Um, 
and uh, of course your dental implants, and of course addressing your uh, your dental or your black triangle. So just just to clarify, lateralization means uh, um, making the canines your lateral incisors. Reshaping your canine into a canine. Mm -hmm. I mean, reshaping your canine into a lateral. Yeah. I see. Is there another term for that? Substitution. Reshaping. Substitution. All it's right. called canine substitution is what, what, what I know. Okay. Yeah. So um, same, same banana. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> banana. So um, that's <laughs> okay. it for micro aesthetics. Now we go into mini aesthetics. And again, mini aesthetics is the teeth in relation to the surrounding soft tissue. So this one is really particular with your vertical relationship. Your transverse dimension of the smile, your smile arc and smile symmetry. Um, this should ring some bells because this one actually is consistent with prosthodontic construction of your complete dentures because this, I think everybody experienced at least once in their life to make uh, complete dentures. So uh, these are actually the rules that they follow. And when they do their trials, they always check this lower facial third. And what I want to do is what I want to emphasize those prosthodontic rules that we usually apply there and bring it over to ortho and make it an important aspect of our treatment plan or also our diagnosis. So I've got a video here I uh, pulled out from uh, Facebook. And um, yeah, this is basically talk about the facial thirds. This is kind of <laughs> funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of funny, and I, I like this video because it, it speaks a lot about lower thirds. Now, of course, no, I, I, I think it speaks. I think it speaks more about your hairline. Uh, about <laughs> who? Sorry. <laughs> that's, All right. that's, that's here. That's here. Yeah, I still match right. it. <laughs> you look, you look very fine, brother. Okay, so um, uh, lower uh, facial thirds are very important because this impacts what you look like. Um, and um, as uh, studies would say that it's the middle facial third that is most stable that we could follow. And most likely that's the one that we could place as well in terms of our proportion for the lower facial height. So if you're gonna ask me, what's, your, what's the basis for your lower facial height? Well, basically it's gonna be your middle facial height. And if you put it according to your facial third, then you have a higher chance to improve your aesthetic value of your patient. Um, so many studies would look at something like this. So this is a patient, a high gingival smile. Um, uh, and I treated this patient uh, from a transverse point of view. I'm not really pleased because I, I enlarged that buccal corridor. I, I may have, I should have maybe tried expansion, mm -hmm. but if you look at the original, it doesn't really look like a hopeful case. And um, looking at the uh, relaxed lips, we look at the presentation of where these teeth could be. Mm -hmm. And where these teeth could be um, certainly should be assessed from this position um, or, or from a vertical rest position where we can properly assess the position of the teeth with the lips so that we can properly approach our um, intrusion cases. And here, uh, this is more of a mandibular rotation kind of patient. And uh, for this patient, um, uh, she was, uh, she had an extraction and a little bit of mandibular rotation, but she falls more into the category of counterclockwise movements, which I will talk more about later. So um, with this impact that you have on this um, lower facial third is, is very high. And, and usually the delusion is that we usually extend or increase this lower facial third, which impacts mm -hmm. both your, um, your aesthetic and your functional aspect of your patient. And next, your macro aesthetics. And this one is very easy. You're correcting facial disproportions, correcting your aging and making your patient look much younger. And of course, considering whether you need some orthognatic surgery. So um, here is uh, one of my students. Um, and uh, basically what I wanna show here, this technique was uh, uh, mm -hmm. given to me by one of uh, my good friend, Dr. Albert, Albert uh, Reguial. And uh, what you're seeing is in the, the picture in the middle is her original, uh, it's it, the uh, original picture. And basically in this um, uh, digital mock-up, what we try to do is we try to follow the right or the left uh, in terms of, um, of placing the position of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the teeth. 
So we see that this occludes all cans as well and this gingival smiles, they highly affect your treatment and they can give a lot of balance to the face of the patient. So merely <coughs> looking inside the mouth doesn't really give you a good point of view when it comes to aesthetics. Yeah, straight teeth will give you better aesthetics, but it's not going to give you the full potential of what your treatment could have given. And I think when it comes to uh, giving treatments to our patients, it really matters um, that difference between giving something that is just right versus something that you're giving, uh, which is uh, um, absolutely right, there, there's a huge difference. And you're not only talking about excellent aesthetics, but you're also talking about excellent function, excellent quality of life. And also, um, just to add on that, um, uh, occlusal facial um, cans for this one, this is one of my patients, and this was the end of his treatment, actually. And as you can see, uh, he has a, uh, a facial cat. And for these kinds of patients, we have to be very sensitive on how we treat them. Because uh, the, the matter of this is that if I follow the international rules on how to uh, take a picture of the patient where the interpupillary line has to be on one plane, but yet that's not the natural head position of your patient, I can give this patient a good look as far as my pictures are concerned. But then it's, it doesn't matter what your pictures look like. What, mm -hmm. matter, what matters is how your patient is going to walk around with his face or with his teeth, with his, his whole facial structure. How he's going to walk around and um, talk to people, interact with them. Because that's, what, um, that's how the patient could feel whether his treatment is good, if people give him high praise or if they're going to give him shame. So um, our treatments should not be based only solely on the pictures, whether how good or bad it looks but rather we should put it in a more natural sense as to what is the natural head position. Okay, what is the natural head position? So we have the, um, the balancing organ here in our ears, in our vestibular organ, and it gives balance to our, our head. So my proposal is that when you're taking photos of your patient, you ask them to sit naturally in just how they would sit uh, in, in a straight position. And then you take another photo that represents that interpupillary line that is appropriate so for this patient, as you can see inside the mouth as well, that there's some canting, uh, a cruzal cant, I could have that choice to intrude that, um, that second quadrant. I asked the patient and I told him what the matter was, that I told him that your eyes are, are not in the proper position. And if we, if we put this in the, uh, if we intrude this, this may uh, give you a, uh, an appearance that your head is crooked when you're walking straight. But then people won't really be Look, able to recognize this when you're um, putting it in a natural position. Yeah, well, Dr. Bao, I have a small uh, question here. So yeah. uh, what you're saying is when we have to assess uh, a patient extra oral, uh, you're saying that you need, to lead, you need to lead the patient to sit or stand in his natural, uh, uh, natural way or, and not give him a predefined stature. Yeah. Right. But my the, proposal the, is you take it in two perspectives: uh, mm -hmm. correct interpupillary line and also the natural. Okay, I see. Because these days, I mean, in my private practice, what I've noticed is uh, almost all the patients, uh, and I, when I ask them to smile, they usually tilt their head a little bit, and 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 give the give the social media Facebook smile. So that's that's always going to give you a canted interpupillary line if if you take that as a particular reference. Uh, so. Uh, what, what, uh, what are you saying? I mean, uh, I'm not able to understand here. Are you saying that, uh, what, what do we do taking these two references? If we, if we take the interpupillary line uh, in, in the natural position as well as in a predefined position, what are we going to do with that? So are, are you, uh, is the question now, uh, which one are you going to follow as far as your Yeah, yeah, different? yeah. Which, which one are we going to follow? All right. Um, a very tricky question. I would follow what the patient tells me. Um, I would follow what the patient would feel natural with. Uh, we can make simulations, digital simulations, where we could show the patient how it's going to look like and what it could look like, um, provided that the eyes are crooked. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we, can, you know, we can only foresee. Some patients may want to test and test the waters and see what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. But that is going to be hard to play around with just moving teeth just because you want to test some things. 
So mm -hmm. um, for me, I would still follow that natural head position because this natural head position depends on uh, an organ that is independent of this whole orofacial structure. It's something that's inside the ears. So that's what I would decide to follow on if I were to be asked. But um, I, I think that there's a lot who would uh, beg to disagree because of this standard of putting that interpupillary line correctly. Dr. Dr. Sunny Gupta also has almost the same concern that I'd raise. He's like, but the patient usually don't know the natural head position. Usually, and especially when taking pictures, they pose. Right, they're they're right. they're a little. Uh, they they're not natural anymore. I mean, they're not normal. They they try to uh, pose or get conscious. The biggest problem we have been facing is to reproduce the natural head position. I've had a lot of issues, especially when it comes to taking cefs as well. Right, even with the uh, with with the, uh, the stand uh, right. and the positioners, the ear rods. I've I've still had issues. I mean, they they yeah. they move a little up, they go a little down here and there, and then we need the Frankfurt parallel to the floor. Yeah. And and these are these are many issues because as you also know, a little bit of change in the head position makes your Ceph absolutely useless. I yeah. mean, you can you can change a class one to a class three by tilting your head up, and you can make him class two because the reference point are all uh, dynamic. At that particular yeah. point, right? They're not static yeah. anymore. So there is no single reference point because your head is moving uh, all throughout, from top to bottom. So I think it's very, very important to identify such guidelines and to make sure that that we follow something of that sort. Uh, but but still, we understand your point when you're saying that in the end, it is the patient who should or shouldn't like his particular smile. So we can go by that. But I would still like to add that we would still need. We would still need to overrule them uh, when it really needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Well, um, putting in guidelines is going to make things stiff because it's really hard to standardize something like this. Um, one standard for one patient, his natural head position would not necessarily reflect the natural head position of another. So I think if this really boils down to how the, how the dentist would create a relaxed atmosphere where where you know you could give your you can allow your patient to re relax a little bit more um not to be so stiff when it comes to pictures um just to relax slouch their so uh, shoulders i usually ask them to exhale because they love to inhale um i usually ask them to just relax your neck um just look straight um as natural as possible and i, I think that's as far as you can get um with your pictures but then it doesn't start in the pictures. It actually starts before the pictures when you're talking to your patient. You have to find out where this natural head position is as, he, as they talk to you. Natural head positions are based um, not only here on the vestibular part, but when everybody, everybody, their Frankfurt planes, whatever the orientation is, standing up or sitting down, their Frankfurt planes are almost always or they're always parallel down to the floor. So um, if in the soft tissue, you're looking for the reed line, in the CEF, you're looking for the Frankfurt plane. And um, to establish that, I mean, it's kind of difficult, but then you have to observe your patient when he walks into your clinic, into your operatory, you have to see, okay, how does this patient orient himself? For these patients who are wearing glasses, it's much more easier because your reed line is basically parallel to your glasses. Um, and as long as you put that, uh, you put your patient flat on the ground, he, th that's going to be parallel. In patients like these that I'm showing, when you pick your glasses, basically what you're going to be able to see is that your glass, their glasses are usually crooked, and they're the ones who usually straighten out their glasses. So um, it, it's, uh, yeah, I think um, guidelines could work, uh, but it's really hard to go against something that, uh, uh, a world standard in terms of taking photos um, and I think uh, like very, I said this is uh, supposed to make a thing. A very very important and a very interesting point has been raised by Dr. Ranjit Ramakrishnan. He says that this might be the patient's adaptation to an occlusal cant, uh, something like a Sunday bite, right? So yeah. that's, that's quite possible because uh, patients usually adapt according to um, uh, their uh, cans as well. 
Now, uh, and also Dr. Chandrasekhar Shetty, thank you for joining us, sir. It's a method adopted by patients to camouflage the skeletal malocclusion, almost the same point as Dr. Ramakrishnan. I, I, would, I would agree. I would definitely agree. And that's uh, where, where our topic uh, last week revolved around, where it, it's an adaptation. Um, asymmetries are adaptations. Um, for some patients like this one, you, uh, you have to take out the lower facial third. Uh, look at look at the um, x-rays and see if you have an asymmetry in, in, in that sense. So uh, if you put it in that sense that there is a upper facial third asymmetry, I mean, there's nothing you can do with that. I mean, I haven't seen anybody with eyes that are so perfectly aligned. Mm -hmm. you, you come up with, I tell you, go into your records, look at all your facial photos, cut them in half and flip them over. You're going to get two different faces for each and every patient. So um, there are patients that would be, I, I would say, an adaptation to um, occlusal cans, yeah. But then there would be some patients who are, um, I don't know, uh, they're, they're really challenged in terms of the bone production uh, around that upper facial third. I would, really, so I would part, agree with you. I would agree with you on this, Dr. Pao, saying that because uh, if, if you really have a, a, a big skeletal deformity or some kind of, I've seen that with class threes. I've seen that a lot with these class threes, anterior crossbites, right? They really try to cover up their lips and, and pretend as though nothing has ever ap happened. But when you actually uh, take a picture intra orally, you see that there is a severe underbite and all these things. And you wonder sometimes as to how is he just, how does he look so normal? Uh, that's, that's one aspect of uh, how, how things work. And uh, yeah, uh, coming out of that, <laughs> good luck with you publishing right. cases. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, uh, yeah. this is uh, immediately immediately unacceptable when you have your interpupillary line position like this, and it's very hard to argue with that. But at the end of the day, it's what the patient, um, what you give to the patient that matters. All right. Are we good? Yeah. Yes. All right. So Dr. would you Dr. like Vineet, to share anything? Dr. Dr. Vineet, uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Vineet. He says that that's exactly why we check for their posture and gait. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Let's move on, please. All right. So um, I'm done with the first part on the aesthetic challenges, um, mm -hmm. aesthetic uh, vertical delusion. Uh, uh, I, I think, I, I don't know if you're going to be speaking about this a little further, but I would like to know as to how do you diagnose a high gingival, high gingival smile? How do you know that the patient has a gummy smile, period? All right. Well, it's very tricky because the terminology itself, the question itself says that you have a high gingival smile. So the problem mm -hmm. there is, yeah, I think everybody could have a high gingival smile. I mean, anybody could have a high gingival smile. I think I just think that it will be unfair for patients to be diagnosed on a smiling position. Um, in fact, for these patients, okay, there would be, uh, let's say, two types of uh, high gingival smiles. Those types that would have uh, their lips in the vertical, uh, their incisors showing uh, appropriately uh, one to two millimeters just below the upper lip uh, in the vertical rest position. And then the other group would be uh, those in the vertical rest position where their upper incisors are showing more than three millimeters, which doesn't really look aesthetic. Their upper incisors are really hanging low. So I would say that intrusions for high gingival smiles would only be applicable to those patients who have, who are in the VRP, would have their upper incisors hanging lower than three millimeters or maybe four or five millimeters, depending on the length of the lips as well. Um, uh, and then that, that's when uh, those are the patients that you can treat. But for patients who, who show a vertical rest position with one to two millimeters show of incisors, and then they smile with a high gingiva, I would not dare touch that because in the vertical rest position, which happens about majority of the day, they're going to look kind of old without those upper incisors showing. So what if the patient really says that I don't like my smile? Well, I would ask him to sign a waiver and then in truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so that's that's one way, and so you uh, you're you're talking uh, you're talking from a soft tissue point of it, right? From the macro, uh, sorry, from the macro aesthetic point of view. Yeah, macro and mini aesthetics. Yeah. 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 So now, exactly. So you uh, there's nothing there's nothing to do with the crown length over here. No. Like, would you consider the crown length while correcting or intruding teeth per se? What if the patient has small clinical crowns and has a vertical maxillary excess uh, 
and I think a gummy smile of about say five millimeters. What would you do? Well, small teeth. Uh, definitely, I'll intrude it according to the skeletal position. Mm -hmm. Get that one to two millimeter show uh, from the upper lip and vertical rest position. Whatever the issue is with small teeth, then I would send them to the cosmetic dentist and make them address that situation. Otherwise, I would tell them that their case is really limited. Unfortunate genetic selection. Uh, mm -hmm. That's as far as you can go naturally. One important thing I would love, to, love you to talk about is, uh, because I have a segment on gummy smiles, of course, but I'm not going to go into the intricacies of it. I, I, I know you know a lot more about this than I do. I want you to talk about the biological width. And, biological uh, width. Yeah. And, and what are the precautions uh, which are to be taken while considering crown lengthening and just uh, gingivectomy? All right, well, uh, we know equally, I don't know more than you in that aspect, but I think mm -hmm. I shared here in the uh, in, in, um, in this uh, fa uh, Facebook page on uh, concerning the bio width of the patient. Um, so uh, this is how it goes. And this comes from TMJ First for, uh, Orthodontics from Kazumi Ikeda. The interdental call, which connects the facial and lingual periodontal peaks is a non-keratinized epithelium that allows migration of leukocytes, enabling the immune system to mount an effective immune response in that region. So this biological weight is uh, pertaining to a, um, uh, a defensive um, state or uh, immune response. It is therefore very important to maintain a proper gingival form around each tooth for maintenance of periodontal health when carrying out orthodontic treatment with goals of straightening teeth. Now, in, in certain situations where your teeth are extruded, and you don't have this uh, good biological width, intrusions may, may fix that, but still uh -huh. no guarantee. What you can rely on is, um, if you're going to ask me, is uh, gingival creep, as we call it. It's basically the gums uh, growing back. But then the problem with gingival creep is that there has been no evidence that, um, that uh, the gingiva can reattach via periodontal ligaments on the tooth surface once it's um, uh, separated. So. Um, there's a lot of things to talk about that. I think that will be one uh, whole lecture in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, in terms of intrusion, I don't think you know you can do much with that. You you receive what you get, and then you maintain. Just don't destroy it. If you have it, good for you. If you don't have it, well, you're limited. Uh, doctor, uh, Doctor Christine uh, Maria is asking. Uh, would you consider lip repositioning for gummy smiles? Uh, that's not my uh, cup of tea. Uh, I would ask an a, a orthognatic surgeon or a cosmetic surgeon on that. Um, I think, you know, what about, how about those patients who have short upper lips? I mean, their attachments aren't, aren't that they're, they're short attachments. It's just that structurally, their lips are really short. I mean, you mm -hmm. really can't do anything about that. You, you're going to usually see that in um, Caucasian patients. Uh, mm -hmm. Their upper lips are short. And um, what do you do about that? Yeah, you can release the freedom. Maybe you can improve a little bit. Uh, that's not my, again, that's not my uh, expertise. I will leave that to the people who would be able to uh, um, put anything on that. My, my okay. I think when it comes to the vertical rest position, because that's what I would rather concentrate on rather than high gingival smiles, is that mm -hmm. when it comes to the vertical rest positions, your upper lip and lower lip should softly brush with one another, um, uh, where you get this natural physiological moisturization of your lips. Mm -hmm. that, that's what you're supposed to put your lips on. And okay. uh, if you usually see your patients with dry, uh, dry lips, well, basically, maybe it's sagittally pushed out or maybe it's also vertically challenged where your lips cannot close. That's a very interesting point. Uh, Dr. Santoshikar Shetty again has a question. How do you differentiate gummy smiles from vertical maxillary excess or altered passive eruption? Well, you, you, you of course, you, um, you have to do some critical thinking processes with your, uh, your CEF and also your uh, soft tissue pictures. Make sure that when you're taking the stuff, when you're taking the, uh, the, the pictures, that the lips are always in the natural, relaxed position. I usually ask my patients to just relax and exhale a little bit. Um, just, just blow a little bit of air out. If there's really some good lip competence, then we leave it as is. There are some patients, especially those with loss of lower six, they rotate their jaws. Their jaws are rotated downward and backward, and they us you usually see this mentalis strain. And this mentalis strain is basically they're trying to close their lips 
force it closed, and that's not really good for your patient. That, that's what I showed a few moments ago. So basically, you have to um, uh, look uh, at, and come up with serv uh, um, several perspectives from your soft tissue analysis and also from your Ceph analysis. So now uh, I would like to add on to this. Now, see, uh, uh, what, what I do, especially when it comes to gummy smiles, right? Gummy smile correction or, or however we deal with it. I have a small classification which, which uh, classifies it as extraoral causes and intraoral causes, right? So for me, extraoral causes would be a short upper lip, hypermobile upper lip, some kind of an anterior dentoalveolar extrusion, and a vertical maxillary excess, right? So now anterior dental dentoalveolar extrusion is, is a very, very clear way of, of seeing because when you draw an occlusal plane, you can see that the line is at a different level when it goes from the premolars or the molars and it goes steep down from the canines. That means that there is some kind of an anterior dental extrusion, possibly iatrogenic, which has taken place, which has led to a gummy smile post start of orthodontic treatment. Uh, vertical maxillary excess is definitely a skeletal problem. And yes, uh, there, there are ways of still correcting it orthodontically, but then what happens is uh, it's, it's again a hit and try. We would never know if it's possible to treat it 100%. I would always go by the idea of giving it a try for sure, definitely. But then there is a limit. I mean, you, you're not going to be correcting a 10 millimeter gummy smile with the gums like really uh, aberrant and all those things. Uh, but there is a limit. For me, it's the easier cases are the ones with long clinical crowns with uh, a five or six millimeter gum display is something and a deep bite is something that I would I would prefer in such cases mm -hmm. because yeah. it's it's very it's a very clear indication that intrusion is going to help me right now what Dr Shetty is also talking about is uh, altered passive eruption so as far as I know a passive eruption is the apical migration of the of the gums which is which is uh, caused uh, and uh, just a minute please. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's about it. It's, it's the apical migration of the gingiva, and uh, like the, the this would come under the intraoral causes, like gingival enlargement and altered passive eruption, which can be treated by uh, by gingivoplasty or just by uh, scaling or uh, or something like that. But something has to be done for the extraoral causes that I've, I've possibly mentioned, and orthodontics may be uh, one of the options in conjunction with gum contouring and at the same time crown lengthening uh, if needed of course so i i definitely don't think that it's it's a 100 percent orthodontic job yeah i would echo the same uh, opinion I, I would say the same yeah and and one more thing i would like to add over here is that uh, diagnosing it for me is slightly different Yes, what you're saying is true that uh, a vertical max, a, a, a vertical rest position. Yes, of course, if, if you have about a three or four millimeter show at that particular time, definitely when he or she smiles is going to have a gummy smile, uh, truly said. Uh, for me, uh, a smile is, yes, for a smile is a dynamic process. It's not a static process, right? So I would diagnose a gummy smile based on a video. And I've been seeing this on Facebook uh, by the face uh, guys from Romania. Uh, yeah. and, and, and they, they have these videos, they, they have a natural conversation going on, which is excited, exciting as well as, which is depressing. <laughs> and, uh, so you can see the different elations and the different emotions that a patient goes through. So you can see it all together. You can see the patient smiling, really smiling and just keeping, keeping uh, himself or herself normal. So that is going to give you an exact idea of what a gummy smile is or what the patient really wants. Uh, I, think, I think it's functional as well. Uh, and I have personally had cases where I've just asked the patient to smile in his or her normal way. And what happens is the, the, the patient is conscious, right? When he is in front of the orthodontist and he gives you a very sly smile. He doesn't give you a, a, a natural smile. And this happens when the patient himself does not know that he has a gummy smile. Right, there are very few cases where something like that happens as well. So the patient's smiling, uh, 
lightly and one fine day i see him smiling in his natural fashion which is which is like a big smile and there is such a big occlusal cant and a and a gummy smile and then is when he says that, yeah i have this issue as well so it's very important to identify uh, the smile in different aspects and not in a static dimension is what i, I agree. what i think i think the best way around this is exactly what you said uh, with the face um, the face approach the face revolution approach where you mm-hmm. take videos you you put them in a more natural atmosphere i think it's very challenging for um, for some patients you just say you know stand up there sit up straight okay look at the camera snap All right smile snap and to base your whole diagnosis on that i think would be unfair to what aesthetics is really about when it comes to the soft tissue and how it relates with the patient absolutely All right. Okay, let's so, move on. Would you like to add some uh, some cases? I'm done with my part. Okay. So uh I I will pick on with the uh, the gummy smile and I will go into something else later then. So I think okay. I think uh uh can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. All right. Now we're seeing it, yeah. Okay. So uh I I have a couple of cases with gummy smile and I'm I'm just going to be showing the finished cases over here because I want you to actually see the changes. Uh, uh you you won't believe it but the, I I have a few more cases with uh, which with much more gummy smile than this patient and uh and and there was a slightly different approach to it with crown lengthening and work. But anyways, now let's let's identify this this particular problem. So for the people who haven't actually seen this case, um uh, she was uh, she 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 was my assistant and uh, she had incompetent lips as you can see and she also at the same time had uh, uh, a bidental protrusion with a 6 mm gummy smile uh, so now when she smiled and the, the and, and the and the issue was that she had short clinical crowns as well so when you see intraorally you can see a completely different picture uh you see deep bite you see a deep bite you see uh, you see uh normal uh, not not very expanded upper and lower arches class 2 malocclusion uh slightly increased overjet very flared upper and lower incisors as you can see in this particular case uh she has her third molars intact and uh, the entire dentition is, uh, is 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 present so when i actually received this case uh Uh, extractions had already performed been performed and this as you can see the first row is when i received this case so now i'm going to be talking in in detail uh with uh, in in detail uh, regarding the mechanics that was involved in the correction of this particular case so okay i'll take the questions later uh, now this case when i received it was on a 16016 night eye and uh, the extractions had already been performed and the canines were being retracted halfway the lowers uh, as you can see there is an 016 stainless steel with a loop over here which is trying to close the spaces uh, the implants were already placed now what the, the issue was that everything was done on a very very light wire which ended up in a roller coaster effect uh deepening the bite further so what i decided was i decided to start uh, individually retracting these canines i placed a small segment now now what happened is i made a mistake where the mistake over here was the botch up as you can t- say <laughs> over here was that i i thought that these extensions are going to help me reach somewhere close to the center of resistance uh but in in reality it was absolutely nowhere close to the center of resistance and what exactly happened was i was able to close the spaces but then i deepened the bite you can see from a 70% it's a 90% deep bite over here and now that this has happened the spaces were almost closed so i decided to just go by it close all the spaces and then change my mechanics altogether so once i closed the spaces i retracted the canines closed these anterior spaces and now what i did was i changed these interradicular screws that were placed before between the molars i changed them to izc positions uh and now now let me just explain the mechanics over here this is a very very interesting paper 
by Dr. Almeida in uh, the Dental Press Journal. Uh, you can see the mechanics explained beautifully over here. Whenever we use IZCs and buckle shelves, what happens is you have a clockwise rotation of the maxillary occlusal plane and you have a counterclockwise rotation of the mandibular occlusal plane. You will have some amount of intrusion at the level of the molars, which is beneficial to you because of the fact that distalization always ends up in extrusion of posterior teeth, increasing the mandibular plane and rotating the mandibular plane in a clockwise direction, which is detrimental to the class two itself, increasing the mandibular plane, right? But what happens when you use bone screws is that you have a CC rotation, which is beneficial. Now, exactly what's happened over here is that, so to control this particular effect, because this is not what I want, I don't want the extrusion of the anteriors to take place. So what I did was I placed a third screw over here uh, and a third screw, what it does exactly is it starts to intrude. It, it, it is used as an intrusive vector over there in order to correct the, or nullify the side effect of the extrusion. As you can see over here, this picture has been taken by, uh, uh, taken from uh, Dr. Chang's paper uh, in IJOI. Yeah, so what I did was, was this. I changed the position of these uh, uh, interradicular screws to IZCs. I placed two more screws over here in the front and I tend to place the screws between the central and the lateral incisors instead of placing them between the lateral and the canine because I feel that the canine has a very, very uh, large root surface area which is going to uh, create some kind of an issue while intrusion. Uh, so I tend to place it uh, somewhere between the centrals and the laterals uh, and give very light forces. I'm going to go into the wires and the forces. Now, the wires that have been used over here for this particular stage uh, is a 19 by 25 stainless steel with hooks between the lateral and the canines. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, uh, at the same time, uh, we, we, we can see that, yeah, we can see that the retraction is going on from the posterior implants. So we have posterior retraction and we have anterior intrusion taking place at the same time. Now, posterior retraction is beneficial to the anterior intrusion because the side effect of the anterior intrusion is the flaring component in the incisors and that is nullified by the retraction. So we have intrusion and retraction taking place as a resultant vector. Now you can see that the deep bite uh, has been corrected gradually by the intrusion, as you can see more display on the lower brackets. The wire is still the same. And uh, yeah, once uh, the intrusion and the distalization, uh, yeah, uh, did I, I, I think I forgot to mention that I extracted the third molars before, before this, this particular stage. Uh, so that gave me enough room for the uppers to distalize. And uh, yeah, this is, on D-bond, as you can see that the clinical crowns have become even shorter. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she definitely needs some amount of uh, gum contouring now. Now, let me go into the little theory part over here, which Dr. Powers mm -hmm. already mentioned. Two to four millimeters of gummy smile. For me, it's, it's uh, uh, with a maximum smile uh, is orthodontics only. Four to eight millimeters orthodontics with some gum contouring uh, or maybe crown lengthening, but more than eight millimeters is something that I think needs to go in for surgery because that is a definite vertical maxillary excess case. So this is the smile of the patient and the intraoral after the gum contouring. So you see after gum contouring, she gets another, she gets, she gets a whole new life altogether. Uh, now, you can see these superimpositions. Now, I was I was really worried that I, I had pushed these roots out of the bone, but luckily it was not so. You can see a little bit of uh, periodontal uh, widening over there as a result of the intrusive forces. But you can see the amount of retraction, uprightening of the upper incisors and the lower incisors intrusion, uh, which has uh, uh, which has actually benefited and given her a much better and a pleasing uh, aesthetic display. Uh, yeah. Smile line 
can be classified as follows. And this is again from Dr. Chang's paper, a low smile line. I think this is what you were talking about, but in different rational. Uh, low smile lines are something like this, uh, exposing less than 75% of the maxillary incisors and no gingiva. It's seen in about 20% of the cases. So this is a low smile line. Now we're talking about all these smiles happening in its widest form. Uh, so when, if, for example, a patient smiling like this in the best particular way, in her maximum smile position, then she is classified into a low smile line category. Average smile line is about 75%, 200% exposure of the maxillary anterior teeth uh, with interproximal gingiva. And now this usually happens, as you can see, in about 69% of the population. Now, these are the cases. These are the cases which... Which, which are pretty easy to, to treat because they have, they have a very white smile and then they have this dummy smile, right? So intrusion is going to give you a far better, far better effect. Now, you might really have to check on these two kind of cases, whether they're actually smiling right or not. But these cases are very easy to diagnose because they just come in in a very bubbly manner and you know that they're not faking it. Uh, but these are actually just seen in about 10% where you can see more than 100% and you can also see uh, the anterior gums. Uh, what I've noticed in my personal experience is that you can see right through to the posteriors and you can see a gummy smiles even on the posterior teeth as well uh, alongside the anteriors. Now, what? Yeah, so let's get back to our case. Uh, and this is what I was just uh, talking about uh, when Dr. Chandrasekhar raised this question. Uh, my my uh, class, the classification for uh, gingival smiles or the high gingival smiles uh, maybe because of uh, extra oral as well as intra oral causes, as you can see, short upper lip, hypermobile upper lip, anterior dental alveolar extrusions, uh, yeah, and vertical maxillary excess. And intra oral causes may be gingival enlargement, which is usually medicines based, and altered passive eruptions as well. So now, these, this category over here definitely needs some kind of orthodontic intervention, but this category probably. It's, it's more of medicines and just uh, gum contouring with, with little, little or almost no orthodontic intervention which is needed. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the vertical dimension has definitely uh, uh, not been altered much in this particular case. As you could see in the superimpositions that the mandibular plane has all, almost stayed constant. Uh, the, what has changed over here is the competence of the lip, as you can clearly see. Uh, a very, very huge change in the sagittal AP dimension, uh, correcting the bidental incompetent lips to a competent lip situation with a more aesthetic profile. And this is, of course, the best change uh, uh, in, in the gummy smile. You can see that the short clinical crowns uh, were intruded. I think I have gained about, say, four millimeters of intrusion in this particular case alongside gum contouring which has helped me with another two. So in all in all, we were able to give her a very pleasing smile. So I think, uh, I think this, this has already uh, cleared out most of the doubts with the questions and, and the gummy smile aspect of it. For infra, infrazygomatic crestal implants, I usually use a 1.82 or a 12 millimeter dimension screw. And uh, as, as, as I'm just gonna be showing you some process. Uh, now this is exactly the position uh, it's, it's usually somewhere between the first uh, and the second molar that you get to place it. Uh, this is going to be for another session, but I'm just going to be showing you uh, these. Yeah, uh, in Southeast Asian population, by the way, it's very difficult to get a very low uh, infrazygomatic uh, uh, crest to have an implant placed in this kind of position. It's, it's very hard. Uh, what I usually get is something like this. It's, it's really far off from the tooth and uh, it's, it's nowhere somewhere. I mean, you can see the difference. This is almost near the buccal tube and this is way, way above the buccal tube and this is where I get it. But uh, anyways, as long as you know how to control it and the line of action is passing through the center of resistance, you're going to get what you want. Now, let me just explain. If these two implants were not there and if I would have been pulling back from this infrazygomatic screw, I would not have got any intrusion. I would have instead extruded the seg segment again because of the fact that the line of action 
is still below the centripetal resistance. Now it's very important. Now over here, I was somewhere able to reach. I mean, I was able to go there at somewhere around the center of resistance, but still it's a very debatable topic. I don't take the risk. Uh, uh, and I, I, I've seen some videos by Dr. Chris Chang where he says that, yeah, you, you get intrusion and distalization, but I'm sorry. Uh, in my experience, uh, I've, I've, I've done about say more than 50 cases uh, with, the, with this kind of mechanics. Not even in one have I been able to achieve intrusion while retraction using IZCs. Uh, I always needed the third screw over here to control the inclination and to give an intrusive component. Yes, with the lowers, I have seen the counterclockwise rotation, intrusion of the molars, but with the uppers, it was never so. Probably because my positions are wrong or, or, or I don't know how, but then it's never happened with me. There could be a methodological uh, difference in that sense. Uh, maybe, maybe, but I, maybe. I, 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 I haven't seen something like that happening. I've tried a lot though. It's worth to look into that part where uh, gingival smiles can also be caused by, uh, by hyperactive lips where it's, it, the teeth are actually sagittally pushing forward um, mm -hmm. rather than the teeth actually super erupting outside. So I think um, it, we, we have to look at high gingival smiles, not only from a vertical perspective, but also from a sagittal perspective. And mm -hmm. from a sagittal perspective, if you're using only the IZC without mm -hmm. the upper anterior um, uh, implant, I think yeah. maybe that could also be possible. Plausible. <laughs> Plausible, yeah. Now, okay, um, so do we have any sure. questions? So I have a question. Oh yeah, please. Uh, um, you know, some uh, some lecture from the Western area, uh, mm -hmm. Western country, uh, some lectures from there would say that uh, putting your brackets in the lower position would correct gingival smiles. You mean uh, incis incisal positioning of the putting brackets? Putting it in an incisal position, yeah. Oh, yeah. I How mean, do you feel about that? Yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, I'm okay with that. I think it should work as well. There's nothing that's wrong. If you think about it, there's, there's absolutely nothing that's wrong. I would do that if I have long clinical crowns and if I really want to intrude my upper teeth, makes sense. I've seen one doctor, Dr. Vivek, uh, Venkat Ambika, uh, uh, and he places his uh, uh, brackets very low and he incorporates a curve of speed on the wire, uh, wild retraction. So that, that's it. it, it aids on it. I mean, the incisal position intrudes as it is. And the curve of speed controls the inclination of the incisors while retracting them. So it's a win-win situation. Now, yes, I mean, a third implant is always an added benefit from the biomechanical point of view. You have less control uh, with the Sondi prescription brackets and, and, and all those things. Uh, you, you can use that for deep bites. For open bites, you place them more uh, gingival. So you can, you can play around with that. And... Uh, I mean, for smile arc protection, I've even heard, uh, seen Dr. Pitt's protocol. I mean, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a very funny thing that happened with me once. One of, one of my patients just came into the clinic and she's like, yeah, yeah. I'm getting braces done over here. I'm like, I can't see your braces. She's like, yeah, I have braces. I'm like, I, I just can't see your braces. Mm -hmm. Then when she, when, when she had to literally lift her lips up and then I was yeah. like, whoa, you have braces. Are these placed in uh -huh. the wrong, wrong, wrong positions? And no, she's like, yeah, I've got it done. I've got it done in the States. I'm like, yeah, I mean, uh, this is surprising. I've never seen bracket placements this high. Then, uh, I, surprisingly, I was just reading about something and it just came off. And uh, Pitt's protocol says that, I mean, they place the brackets really, really high up in the gingival, gingival margin. And I was surprised. Uh, but that's, that's another particular way. The Pitt's 21 brackets uh, and the positioning systems, which, uh, which protect the smile arc. So people do different things. Uh -huh. These are just nouns. The Damon system, Pitt's yeah. protocol. And, and uh, you, we have a name to everything, but it's basically mm -hmm. just common sense. All right. <laughs> okay, so we have a few questions here from uh, Panthe Zinvo. Uh, how did you correct mild class two molar relation in your assistant patient, sir? Did you use class two elastics? Can I just go back? Yep. Uh, okay. How did I correct the mild class two?
Okay, yeah. I have used class two elastics as well over here uh, in conjunction with the intrusive component and the retractive component to get the molars to a better class one position. Yes. Uh -huh. You can see the elastics positioned over there. I usually keep them very light. I don't yeah. cross medium elastics, uh, not for anything. Uh, the hardest I've probably gone is uh, three by 16 medium. One by, uh, eight is was, for, would... one by eight is just for positioning locally those triangular elastics. But the maximum I've gone pushed hard is three by sixteen medium. Uh, so so do I. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So from uh, Doctor Ranjit Rama uh, Ramakrishnan, do you use pal palatal implants along with IZC for intrusion of posterior maxilla, or do you rely on the clockwise rotation by IZC? Okay. So uh, I so is... yeah. So uh, I mean, it it, it uh, I'm I'm going to be getting into that. I'm going to be getting into that topic where we're going to be talking about how how I intrude molars. I usually use a transpalatal arch uh, for my palatal control. Uh, if I am using uh, cases from, uh, uh, if I'm using IZCs uh, or the buckle or, or the interradicular uh, implants uh, outside, I control the palatal inclinations using a transpalatal arch. Uh, I've got sufficient amount of success with that. I have. My first option is definitely placing palatal pads to give a, a, a very controlled intrusive vector. But uh, in retraction cases, I usually don't go in for that. I usually don't. Okay. Um, a follow-up question by Dr. Maria <laughs> De, uh, Vasojevic. Sorry about mm -hmm. that. Uh, is the intrusion stable movement? Okay. Intrusion is a very unstable movement because there is no fourth wall over there which is going to prevent it from coming down back. So it has to be done very, very slowly in conjunction with the root, uh, the, the remodeling, or else you're going to have severe amount of resorption, number one. And number two, your retention protocol has to be perfect. You have to cater for the intrusion. You can't forget about it. Or else what's going to happen is that the teeth are going to extrude back, especially in the posteriors uh, and even in the anteriors, because there's, there's, no, uh, there's no stopping it. So... I'll get to it. I will get to it and I will be explaining my retention protocol for such cases. I think I saw in one of your pictures that you still kept the uh, IZC uh, installed yeah. even without the bracket. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I'll be getting to All it. Right. I'll be getting to it. Okay. Um, okay. So from Dr. Kathir Ravan, Kathir, in what cases are segmental mechanics used for retraction and intrusion of upper arch? Okay, sir. So, uh, Dr. Kathir Rawan, thank you for joining us. Um, he's a very good friend. Uh, so, the, the question is that when do I use segmental and when do I follow uh, continuous arch wire mechanics? Uh, for example, I prefer using segmental mechanics for retraction purposes because of the fact that continuous arch wires, they provide uh, resistance to sliding. I've had a lot of difficulties, especially uh, with continuous arch wire with this kind of mechanics over here uh, because the implant is usually placed at a higher position. The force vector is always going down. And what happens is, if you can see my screen, the direction of the force is in a way that it pulls the wire up. When the wire is pulled up and back, it presses against the top wall of this particular bracket, this particular bracket, this particular bracket, creating more resistance, more friction in terms of binding and notching. And what happens is it delays the retraction. Uh, so what I prefer is, what I, what I prefer to do is uh, I, I usually go in for segmental arch uh, techniques in which like, like the case that, uh, one of the cases that I have published is, is this, and uh, many of you have already possibly seen this. I'm just gonna get back to this case, uh, just to answer your question. This is my, this is my retraction uh, methodology uh, for uh, extraction cases. As you can see, I place the implants usually between the molars, and then I have a third implant over here. And if the canines are not retracted, well and good, I keep them here as well. But if they are retracted or somewhere in between, if it's a retreatment case, I would individually retract them using this segment. I would go in for power chains like this and here, which would give me good anteroposterior as well as a vertical control because I don't want these four front teeth to dump 
by just a position over here because these hooks are nowhere close to the center of resistance as in the case that I showed you with the gummy smile. The mistake I did there was I did not incorporate a third mini screw like I did in this particular case. So if this was here, I wouldn't have needed what I did. Probably the gummy smile would have been corrected while retracting itself. So anyways, I prefer retraction using segments because it's a determinate force system. If I calculate about 150 grams of force, I know 150 grams of force is going exactly for the purpose of retraction and not lost in binding, notching, friction, uh, sliding of the continuous arch wire, right? So that's exactly, and, and moreover, anecdotally speaking, I have seen a difference of at least three to four months in retraction uh, speed. So mm -hmm. there, there you go. That's, that's the answer. I, I, I use it uh, for deep bite cases, extraction cases, uh, without even thinking about it twice. Uh, what would you say the net force of the elastic uh, is? What in force? Of, which uh, force per, again? The, the net oh, yeah. force coming from how the I, how I How I calculate it, how I calculate is if the canines yeah. are still there, I give canines 100 grams, 75, 75, 75, 75, 100. 75 All for right. the four incisors, 100 for the canines, and then I divide it by two. Going lesser yeah. is still helpful. Going more is the issue. Yeah. Okay. So everyone, he did not just uh, uh, calculate that. He actually used a tension gauge, I would believe. So. Um, uh, absolutely. So, yeah, 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 yeah. You need a you need a Dontrix uh, force gauge for this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And another question is uh, from Dr. Rahul Ahiro. Uh, why you change your posterior interdental micro implants to IZC? Okay. Now getting back to the case, uh, I changed the position over here to an inter for an IZC because of the fact that I extracted the third molars and I wanted the entire upper arch to move back. If I would have continued with the interdental or the interradicular implant, I would have seen some interference, right? The teeth would not have gone back because they're right between the roots of the first and the second molars. Mm -hmm. All right. That's it. That's it. So, um... uh, yeah, Dr. Kathir Ravan, I think has another question. Uh, he's asked in segmental mechanics, uh, we will have two planes. Yes, of course. So that's a very, very interesting point. Now, exactly why I mentioned that we would do it in a deep bite case per se is because of this. As you can see over here, that the anteriors are positioned very low. So intruding that and keeping the posterior plane stable would still maintain uh, some kind of uh, uh, a stable occlusal point. As you can see over here at this particular point still, there is a difference. This is at another plane and this is still at a plane lower, right? So I would still continue if, that's, that's again my point. Segmented mechanics are good if you have ADE, that is anterior dental extrusion, right? Or a two plane defect already, like, like in orthognathic surgical cases. Uh, these are difficult ones. Now, how I correct it later is once I get the intrusion done, I maintain the, the vertical implant over here. I maintain the force because I don't want this to go back to the level of this plane, right? So I maintain this. I put in a very thick uh, 18 or 1725 night eye and I use long ligatures over here. Uh, long ligatures, sorry, long power chains over here to not or reopen the spaces because the roots are not very parallel after segmental mechanics. You have those diverging roots. And what this does is it maintains the crown position where it is and it uprights the roots. And then you can see that now you have one single occlusal plane and the gummy smile is also gone. And you can see the amount of intrusion and retraction that has taken place. So uh, Dr. Kathir Rawan, I would really urge if, if, you, if you would like to know more about this particular case, you can go in. And have a look at this case report published in Case Reports in Dentistry, a novel temporary anchorage device aided sectional mechanics for simultaneous orthodontic retraction and intrusion. It's a paper by both of us. It's, it's by Dr. Bao and by me as well. And it's an open access uh, journal. So you, 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 can, you can have what you want. I, I think uh, we also substantiated his follow-up question, uh, which is, uh, 
in segmental mechanics, we will have yeah, two that's, frames that's in upper exactly. arch after intrusion. That's what I answered. All right. Um, next question from uh, Dr. Rian Sumang. Sir, do you have, uh, do you, uh, do you consider using reverse curve speed wires in some of your cases? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, I do. And I will be talking about that. I will be talking about that. Uh, in uh, I, I started off actually from the middle because Dr. Pao ended up with gummy smile. So I, I got you into the gummy smile zone. But I'm going to be starting with the AP intrusion retraction where I'm going to be talking about reverse curves. All right. Yeah. Right? Take it away. Okay. So... What I'm going to be basically talking about today is the changes in the vertical dimension. Can, can you play uh, your uh, PowerPoint? Oh my God. So you can see me all this while? Yeah. Oh, you mean, you mean this, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the changes in the vertical dimension that I'm going to be talking about today are especially incisor intrusional while retraction, right? So uh, usually we tend to create a deep bite while retracting. And uh, uh, how do we control that? Incisor and molar intrusional while retraction, of course, like the case that I already showed you, uh, the gummy smiles is how it's, uh, how it's corrected. Uh, the third is active gummy smile corrections, uh, as I've already mentioned. Molar intrusion for prosthetic purposes. And that's uh, if uh, a lower molar is missing, uh, then we would need to intrude the upper molars. And how do we do that? And that's going to change the vertical dimension. Using reverse curves uh, and its effects on molars especially. Uh, occlusal cans, as uh, uh, we would be speaking about as well. And end mass distalization resulting in bite opening, uh, especially in class three cases. And I'm going to be showing you the mechanics of how it works on. Scissor bites are very, very difficult. In my experience, the hardest cases are scissor bites, case, scissor bite cases, and leading to change in the vertical dimensions. Uprighting lingually tipped lower molars. How do you upright them and how do you maintain the uh, vertical dimension? So now I'm going to be starting with uh, one of my favorite cases, and I always start my lectures with this particular case. <laughs> uh, anyways. Now, this case is a bidental protrusion case. Uh, you can see it, she has a class one molar relationship, class one canine relationship. And uh, she has flared teeth, as you can even see. Uh, and she has slightly, she has a defect with a lower third. I, I feel that her lower third is a little deficient in this particular uh, picture. Uh, she was a very simple four by four extraction case. You can see a very slight occlusal cant. Uh, which I'm going to be showing you over here. She has a very, very slight occlusal cant, as Dr. Powell also mentioned in one of his cases. Uh, now, how I identify it as to which is the good side and which is the bad side is, as Dr. Powell said, you can cut this picture into two halves and then you can flip it and, and you can ask the patient, which, which picture do you like more? If she says the other one, it's okay. If she says that I like the one without, then we'll go by that because uh, it's, it's relative. Now, this is a decision you have to take. There's absolutely nothing wrong or nothing right when you're, when you're treating uh, mild occlusal cant cases or uh, gummy smile cases, because a little bit of gummy smile sometimes looks good in girls. Yeah. So, uh, extraction of force, you can, you can, you can see that I've used, uh, hooks of different sizes. One is a small hook. One is a big uh, hook, which I've bent into the wire itself. Now this was with the rational of correcting the occlusal cant. I wanted a slight intrusive vector, uh, over here as well as a more parallel vector over here. Now, this was my thinking. This was my thinking. This is absolutely, uh, uh this is really far away from the truth though. <laughs> I thought that having a uh, hypo mechanics like this is going to intrude the segment, but uh, the fact was that I'm, I'm nowhere close to the center of resistance. So what happens is this is still going to extrude. This is still going to go down and nothing, of, nothing, uh, nothing like intrusion is going to take place with this. Mm -hmm. And over here, what's going to happen is uh, you're going to still have some amount of intrusion, but because of more parallel forces, you're, you're not going to have uh, extrusion, but you're going to have uh, translation. Uh, the lowers I've used, uh, I, I don't usually place uh, implants on the lowers because the second molars are more than enough. Uh, to um, uh, keep the anchorage value in control. Uh, so post-retraction, now the, the, the good thing over here, now let me explain to you why I'm showing you this case. Uh, what, I'm, what I wanted to show you is that how do you control 
and how do you actively intrude while retracting let me let me uh, let me tell you some 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 things over here if this particular mechanics was used per se without a third implant which which is the case the ideal and the normal movement that is going to take place is going to be extrusion is you're going to find extrusion of 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 these teeth by the drawbridge effect and uh, what's going to happen is it's going to increase her gummy smile in order to counter that there are two ways one either we place a third implant over here or the fourth the, the easiest way as published by dr ki chun li in the angle orthodontist is incorporating labial crown torque on the incisors if you incorporate labial crown torque on the upper incisors and still use this uh, method of pulling you're going to generate a resultant vector which is intrusive and retractive in nature and so what happens is you do not need the third implant over there now this i use as a precautionary measure where i have very mild gummy smiles and i don't want to increase the gummy smile post retraction so i would just do this but in cases which have been started which have started with a gummy smile altogether uh, i would actively place a third implant and actively intrude while pulling back so uh this was the finish you can see that uh, uh i was able to maintain the vertical dimension and you can see good amount of intrusion that has taken place alongside retraction again there was absolutely no intrusive force that i used right so there shouldn't be any kind of intrusion logically speaking while retracting because i did not use a third implant i did not use any high pull mechanics it was in, in fact lower than the center of resistance but then how did i gain this amount of incisor intrusion so the answer is to that answer is that paper by dr ki jundi which i urge everybody to read is incorporating labial root torque alongside retraction that generates a net intrusive force on the incisors uh so you can see the change in the aesthetics it's profound it's it's given her uh, a much better uh, smile and profile do we have a question on that dr pau Um, not really, but we have one question here from Dr. Rowena Escalona. I think this um, may pertain to your previous case. Uh, do you recommend using DIY intrusion wires for upriding molars? Do it yourself? Is it DIY? I, maybe. I think these are uh, intrusion arches. Maybe. I haven't heard of them. Uh, I, I don't know what to do with uh, DIY, DIY intrusion arches. I'm, I'm sorry. neither have i uh but i think that's as close as we could get um auxiliary arches if it's anything to do with with diy i recommend no <laughs> <laughs> i think it's a um maybe it's just not straight wire it's something that you intentionally uh bent maybe that's what it means i uh, i i'm not very sure about it if you could just explain what diy means it's going to make things clear aha uh -huh. <laughs> all right very very tricky question Okay. Um yeah. uh, we have no further questions. Um okay. would you like to add anything else? No, no, not about this case. So the key from that case was to give a labial root to a labial crown talk while uh, while retraction in cases uh in which you may anticipate some amount of extrusion. Right? Yep. Yeah. Excellent point. Okay. Now Coming to the next case, you can see this case is again a class one canine molar high angle biprotrusive face, right? Now in this case, I plan to do it exactly the same way as the other case, but I just wanted to add molar intrusion because whenever I see a high angle, I I I like in a class two. What I do is I intrude the molars to gain CC rotation, trying to make the angle of the mandible a little flatter. and then going for ap sagittal retraction which gives you a better pleasing profile compared to just retraction in the ap and not changing the vertical dimension i tried placing implants but the implants failed uh it may be a mechanical a technical error from my side but also maybe because of the oral hygiene of the patient i would never know uh so what i decided was 
this is answering another question is that I placed a transpalatal arch in this particular case. Now I was again a fool to think that a transpalatal arch is gonna gain any kind of anchorage, which I used to think at that particular point. So to reinforce that, I even added some flow resin composite, uh, thinking that it's gonna benefit the anchorage uh, value. But yeah, nothing of that sort happened. And uh, by the way, let me just clarify this again, that a transpalatal arch is absolutely useless when it comes to, uh, uh, when it comes to anchorage, uh, because it'll, it'll in fact get both the molars forward and you're gonna lose anchorage <laughs> in a very, uh, uh, it, it's, it's almost the same as not using it at all. But definitely it has, it has its effects in controlling the intermolar width and at the same time, vertical control. Now, let me explain. These two cases are different. The cast or the models are of a different patient compared to this. In this particular patient, the bands were on the second molar and here you can see the bands are on the first molar. I usually extend a hook uh, from this design uh, in uh, somewhere at the area of the mini screw, the probable area of the mini screw, where I would uh, like to place the mini screw. But in this case, since the mini screw had failed, uh, I, I didn't have much of an option over there. Uh, and I went on with the retraction. The key over mm -hmm. here is I place the, uh, what do you call this? I, I place the transparent arch, the hooks over here, I place them a little higher, uh, that is away from the palate, about four to five millimeters away from the palate. Uh, and I'll show you the indentations on the tori uh, later to show that it, it had pressed onto the gums. Now, alongside this, a better design may be to place some acrylic over here, as Dr. Uh, Sunny Gupta had once suggested to me. Uh, he had mentioned that uh, placing uh, some kind of an acrylic over here is going to make it easier for the tongue to push on it and uh, gain some amount of uh, intrusion, additional intrusion. Alongside, uh, yeah, so, so basically the, the rationale behind this is that a patient uh, swallows, a person usually swallows about 800 times a day, right? Now, 800 times a day, and it has been quantified that Every time the patient swallows, the tongue generates a pressure of about 500 grams. So it's an intermittent force of 500 grams, 800 times a day. So that's definitely a lot of force and which can aid with the intrusion. So if utilized in a very proper way, it can gain sufficient amount of intrusion. Uh, so that was for the counterclockwise rotation. And definitely you had to just pull back for the AP, AP movement which you can clearly see over here. I've placed these long hooks because I wanted the forces to be as parallel as possible, gaining this translation. And as you can see over here, I'm, I'm using the second molar, the hooks over here, which I've incorporated on, 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 onto the appliance to just retract. I'm not looking in for any kind of maximum anchorage over here because of the fact that I've learned that especially in Southeast Asian population, um, and as I also uh, mentioned in the first part of Botched, that lip retraction is a function of many factors, not just uh, extraction and retraction. It's, it's not just three is to one all the time. It's, it's a function of lip thickness. It's, it's a function of lip tonicity. It's, it's a function of the amount of distance uh, behind the uh, labial, uh, sorry, the, the lingual aspect of the lip and the labial aspect of your teeth, the amount of gap that's available over there. And of course, your race, uh, Afro-Americans, uh, they, they have thicker lips. And, uh, and, and finally, the most important thing that I have found in my patients is that competence is a very, very important function. Uh, once I achieve lip competence, the amount of lip correction is very, very less after that point. But till the time I achieve competence, it's quite a bit. So that's, that's my uh, clinical evidence. Uh, I would like to put it that way. Now, as you can see, because of the, uh, uh, the intrusion, uh, what, what has happened is I've, I've been able to gain a lot of CC rotation of the mandible, which has given me a better profile. As you can see, there is uh, a change in the profile and you can see a change in the mandibular plane angle. You see this is high and this is still high, but not as high as the pre. So this is what I'm talking about now. How else am I going to correct apart from a TPA 
the first option is E for me. At any, any day, I would place two palatal implants, two buccal implants, intrude the maxillary uh, first molars or second molars. What I usually do is I also place some separators over here because I, uh, intrusion needs space. You need to gain some space. And I place the separators, take them off. I have those. I have the one millimeter space or the 0.5 millimeter space, which is, which is, which makes it easier for my molars to intrude. Uh, I sometimes place a wire occlusally, uh, which is a night eye, and then I go by the same norm of using a TPA, which is placed high, about five millimeters away from the palate, which would push the second molars and in turn push the first molars as well. And I do not include the second molars into the wire segment. I, I leave it alone because the tongue can independently push this harder and uh, because this is reciprocal anchorage, right? I don't want reciprocal anchorage while I'm intruding molars. Uh, that, that defies the entire purpose of doing so. So I want to keep that segment as, as aloof as possible. Uh, and if, if needed, I ban both and, and do the same thing. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this is actually the case that is shown over here. You can see some amount of buccal tipping of the upper posterior teeth. Uh, so a little bit of uh, intrusive and uh, lingual or palatal uh, pull is going to correct these inclinations as well and, and close the bite. Because you can see the palatal cuffs are hanging over in these cases and that's the reason for the open bite. So just pulling it in is going to get the palatal cusps in and correct the open bite over here along with uh, uh, what do you call this, along with a, a, an intrusion of the molars, which is going to correct this class two edge to edge to a class one canine. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's what you can take away here. So can I have the questions, please, Dr. Paul? Uh, well, we have uh, only one question so far, but uh, I would like to just echo those, uh, that statement that you said a while ago that your TPAs uh, have no sagittal value. Uh, I, I, I definitely agree. They would have some vertical uh, value. I think their, their value is more on the vertical rather than on the sagittal. And uh, yes, intermolar distance. Um, time to time, you can re uh, rely on it on the transverse um, mm -hmm. aspect, but then uh, it's more of a vertical appliance than it is something that is sagittal. So if you want something absolute, and I'm gonna talk about this later, uh, there's nothing better uh, than Pat, if you're going to ask me. Um, one question from Dr. Marco uh, Gugrich. Uh, can you use utility intrusion arch instead of intrusion mini screw while retracting? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And I, I have some few slides exactly on that. And I'm going to be showing you as to what kind of um, an appliance design uh, I, I particularly use. All right. Uh, yeah, basically that's the uh, only question we have right now. No, Dr. Ranjit Ramakrishnan has a question. In the scenario C, in the scenario C, how is the first molar going to intrude? Yeah, so the same logic applies over here, Dr. Ramakrishnan. What I'm, what I'm looking for in this particular case is not uh, intrusion much. As of, as, of, as of now, what I'm thinking is just to correct the buccal inclination of the premolars, as you can see over here. Uh, but yes, the minute I uh, correct the buccal inclinations over here, I'm going to be cutting the segment. I'm not going to have this first molar incorporated with this. I'm going to be taking off everything. Now, the TPA over here is placed at least five millimeters away from the palate. Active tongue push is going to pull and push the molars up. The molars up then is when i'm going to be engaging uh the particular arch wire over here uh because uh, this is going to give me stable uh forces there and is going to try to intrude this particular entire this 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 posterior segment as well the two premolars as well and uh, finally it's going to generate auto rotation of the mandible so i'm depending on the auto rotation of the mandible especially from the molar and the second molar contact over here as you can see now, um, uh, I would just like to add something on this part. Uh, for some uh, uh, some dentists, they would classify this patient as a tongue thruster, and um, uh, just because of these uh, this kind of presence, um, I, I would say that there are uh, two types of tongue thrust: a pseudo and a true tongue thrust. 
these mm-hmm. pseudo tongue thrusts would be those who have an open bite and it's just like a, uh, a like a bird in a cage if you open that cage then the bird will fly out and the other type is like if you have a pit bull inside a cage and that pit bull will kind of break apart that cage so for this one i think this is more like a pseudo um tongue thrust so i would say that this is just like a, a an open bite that is vertically challenged rather than something that is sagittally challenged so um, excellent way on how you approach this, where you had the intrusion on the posteriors from the buckle and the palatal. And uh, I think um, nothing could have been done better than this one. Uh, would you like to add anything? Yeah. yeah, I would like to add something in terms of the tongue thrust. Now, usually when I find these tongue thrust cases, uh, uh, I, I find them with a low tongue position, number one. And I've seen some severe tongue thrusts where you have spaces between the lower dentition. And uh, uh, when you ask them to speak, you, you can see the tongue just pushing out. And especially when you swallow, you ask them to swallow and you see the tongue just coming out from between all the teeth. So that's that's definitely a tongue thruster for me. Now, this kind of mechanics over here, especially when you use a transparent arch, it definitely helps with the tongue thrust as well. It trains your tongue uh, to, to push and to, to keep it up uh, in uh, itself in the palate. So it's, it's like using a lingual pearl. Or, uh, or, wow. or something of that sort, especially if you have an acrylic built in over here. Wow. Um, definitely uh, can help. So that's that's one way. And definitely with the tongue thrust, I've, I've in fact also for, started following a very, very aggressive approach. I use spurs. Uh, and uh, that's traumatizing for the patient though, but nothing better than that. <laughs> tongue is uh, the hardest muscle to train. It has a, it has a very, very strong memory. Um, yeah. And it needs restraint. Um, uh, another question from Dr. Panty is in, so when I intrude upper molars, should or not remove, should I not remove uh, last molars? Please suggest. Yes. That's a very important, po- <clears throat> very interesting point. I, uh-huh. uh, I don't include that in the arch. If I'm intruding something, I don't, in- I, I don't engage. Unless and until I'm, mm-hmm. I'm on a very light wire. If I'm on a very uh-huh. light wire, it doesn't matter. But if I'm on a 16 by 22 or up, I don't because that that would actually not let the molar intrude because it's taking reciprocal anchorage from the anterior segments. Oh. So, uh, um, another as- uh, another um, aspect to this is that uh, you can also have some uh, crowding in the vertical dimension. Uh, crowding doesn't only happen in the uh, sagittal dimension where it's it's just uh, you know buccalized or lingualized or locked in something like that. You can get some crowding, which in, in the in a manifestation of a vertical extrusion coming from the posteriors. So uh, yes, I, I would suggest also that you have to extract, especially when you have to intrude. Absolutely, uh, intrusion needs space. Intrusion needs space, and you can see in one of the aspects I placed a separator as well, because this was probably a non-extraction case, and I still needed some space. And uh, I, I found just placing separators gained some space over there, which would just let you intrude. And most of these times, most of the times when you're intruding the first or the second molar, it's always better to get the third molar out. All right. So another question from Dr. Corina Netku. In extraction cases, until you reach the stainless steel wires to do the retraction with loops, posted arch, uh, posted arch wires, do you use lace back or just level in line? Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, in case... Uh, now this is this is a very interesting question, and I, I don't think if you attended uh, uh, my first segment of botched where I had presented the case of this very young girl, uh, which I'd finished in about nine months' time. Now what I what I usually do is, in case there is a posterior crowding or something of that aspect, I place the I extract the first day, I place the implant the first day, and I'm I'm gonna be I'm I. I you can you can use it. I mean, you can use indirect anchorage or direct anchorage as well. You can use a light night eye wire. You can give a a a, a, a short la, a ligature from the canine to canine, and you can use ligature ties from the implant onto the canine. Uh, light forces, which would uh, give a sense of direction uh, to the anteriors to alleviate the crowding and to come into the extraction space rather than go out further. So that's very important. And, and number two is that if, for example, uh, the, yes, that, that was your question, wasn't it? Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. So I, I do use lace backs, but I prefer using lace backs from the implants and not from the molars because lace backs, according to me, uh, would lose anchorage. Uh, I, I don't see how a lace back is going to keep your anchorage constant because mesial movement is way easier than distal movement. So molars would move for, forward really quick. Okay, um, from Dr. Samuel Minzat, the loop of the TPA is oriented to the Michel. Does it matter? Does the position matter? Um, I've, I've tried to find a lot of evidence based on this, but I, I think I think this is the best design. Um, I, I really don't know from a bio... I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm not very sure from a biomechanical point of view as to how it alters. I have seen some certain cases where they say that the... Uh, the 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 rotation on the molars is of a different angulation, but I find it insignificant. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that it doesn't matter as long as the uh, the loop is within the Michel and distal uh, 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 the proximal. I mean, the width of the molar. Okay, I so see. another question from uh, uh, Dr. Bara Hanna. First, thank you for your nice presentation, Doctor. I do have a question. So you suggest you use segmental mechanics when we are intruding teeth, like only one or two at a time? Uh, if you're talking about for the time being, yes. The answer is yes, I would. I would just do this. But as you can see in this particular case, there's absolutely, there are no brackets. It's just two implants and intrusion happening. Now, why I would prefer doing this before is because if I place the brackets right through and, and place a buccal tube over here, I'm going to have relative extrusion of the premolars rather than intrusion of the molars. And I don't want that to happen. So it's always better to intrude the molars first, get it into a decent occlusional plane, and then place the brackets. But if your question is, would I just call it a day uh, intruding the molars? No, I wouldn't because that would that would end up in some amount of rotation of the mandible, it would change the occlusion yeah. of the patient, it would change many, many factors. And just doing that is not the right thing. I've had cases in which uh, they wanted to place lower molar implants and they're like, doctor, please just intrude the molars a bit and everything else is okay. I say, no, I can't do that. Because just, just doing that is going to alter the occlusion at some other point. And when that happens, they're going to develop some other issue. Intercuspation is not going to be good. I've changed their uh, centric occlusion. Uh, that's what you say, right? And yeah. finally, it uh, might end up in a TMJ issue or, or something of that sort. So I, I don't want to risk that. I would temporarily do it for a transient period, segmental, but eventually I would include the entire arch. Yeah. Um, I would agree as well. But I think it also depends on the treatment objective on what you have to do. So, um, and... Uh, it's really hard to intrude a whole arch in a sense. So I think um, for me, I haven't intruded a whole arch in one go. I usually mm -hmm. do it in segments, um, even if I have four implants all in all. So another question from Dr. Uh, Verhel, uh, John Ursia. What can you say about controlling the vertical dimension at the leveling stage caused by the behavior of the night eye wire on pre-adjusted bracket tips? Uh, what Kessling advocates with his tip edge bracket and banding the second molars. Okay. So banding the second molars and you now it's a, it's a very re relative question. See, uh, I do completely agree with the pre-adjusted edge wise uh, philosophy of, of, of tips and what, what, what it does. And now I'm going to get to my next segment over here and you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I was discussing this with Dr. Pao yesterday, the effect of running a plain, simple night eye on curve of speed correction, that is intrusion and extrusion on high angle and low angle cases. So I think the next segment is going to answer your question um, in, in particular. Uh, yeah, I think you'll have to wait a little bit for yeah. that segment. I'll be talking about that as well in, in a short while. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we have no further questions. Um, I think we have a suggestion. Yeah, we... We we have we have a little bit of uh, we have a little bit of uh, 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 a reference here by Dr. Ramakrishnan, and I think this is going to be beneficial for everybody. Uh, Settlin et al. has uh, given a reference about the TPA loop for intrusion. So yeah, 
And Dr. Ramakrishnan, if you could just uh, get, uh, get us the uh, reference for it, and then uh, it, it would be beneficial for everybody. Thank you so much. All right. So um, should we move on to the next segment on functional uh, uh, delusions? Absolutely. Let's let's go on. And then I'm going to be speaking about the intrusion arches. Uh, okay. I think that's a very favorite topic. And everybody so wants go to. go first? Yeah, I think you should. And then we will go into the intrusion uh, arches segment. Okay. So can you uh, turn off your screen? <laughs> uh, just a minute, please. Yeah. Stop share. That's what it is, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. So give me a moment. Okay. Okay, so the second aspect that we want to go into is the functional delusions. And uh, basically what we want to talk about here is the diagnostic concept of vertical problems exhibiting um, sagittal discrepancies. So uh, super eruptions coming from your posterior or from your upper arch, or maybe even from your lower arch can also screw up um, your, your uh, classification, your angle classification. So, um, and then also we wanna speak about the simple leveling in the cruisal plane, um, which uh, we already received some questions and also mandibular rotations, which Dr. Addis already has touched on a little bit in his last case that he presented. So, um, uh, uh, I came up with this uh, algorithm, and this one I, I extracted from uh, uh, Ikeda's uh, TMJ first uh, book. And this is about counterclockwise rotation of the mandible and what the idea behind it really is. So counterclockwise is usually needed for patients who have supra eruptions, asymmetries, and also deviations. So I wanna stick to a little bit more to the supra eruptions and not go into the asymmetry and deviations. So when we come up with a counterclockwise movement, there's two ways to go about this. And it depends not only not on the mechanics, but rather it depends on the treatment needs of your patient. So first of all is if do you need a relative counterclockwise movement of the mandible? So here are our options, wire mechanics, bracket placement, and extraction. And in, under the wire mechanics, perhaps we can do some straight wire, uh, multiple or multiple edgewise arch wires, or even uh, your RCS, or um, yeah, of sorts. So um, as far as these treatment mechanics are concerned, they can contribute to a relative movement only. Now, when you need an absolute intrusion, which in effect would cause a counterclockwise rotation, uh, this one would differ in terms of how you approach it. And you have to approach it through TADs, transpalatal arches, and um, for young patients, high pull head gears. Uh, I think there's some, still some people who wear high pool headgears, um, but um, not anywhere near me, I, I would say. So, um, this is, uh, an <laughs> so this is an algorithm uh, that we kind of built because uh, sometimes I get some questions that can I get some intrusion by changing the bracket position or maybe by placing a step up bend or a step down bend of those sorts. So um, if, if you're moving teeth against teeth, again, this is periodontal ligaments against periodontal ligaments, and it's really kind of challenging to know which one is gonna stop and which one is gonna go. So it's reciprocal anchorage in short. And for absolute, if you want to be very sure about your intrusion, then it's the absolute, the absolute way is the way to go via TADS and also transparental arches. So I just wanna substantiate this with um, a few cases. So here's a one case, and um, we, this was a case that was transferred to me, and this is a very uh, something very particular to me. I mean, I I love talking about cases like these where you have the loss of the lower six. In your uh, residency here, Dr. Addis, I believe that you also received substantial amount of loss of the lower six, and um, almost all. One, I I I think it's I think it's generic with the population over here. I yeah, can I can go and, up to vouch and I vouch and say that maybe about eighty percent of my cases don't have molars. I think it will be the same here. So um, the, the main problem with these kinds of patients is that the maxillary mandibular relationship has been uh, uh, changed via some vertical movement. And I want to talk about this later. Uh, but we, I want you to see how your, uh, your, your intrusions uh, through a transpalatal arc could work. So I place a transpalatal arc here on, the, um, on my first molar going to the second molar. And uh, towards the end, well, basically, this is how we ended up. Um, yeah. 
So uh, in these kinds of cases, and this one was the patient that I uh, showed to you a while ago, uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to macro, mini, and micro, uh, the relevance of your intrusion inside the mouth would depend on the outcomes of the whole facial structure. As you can see, we're intruding inside the mouth, but the impact on what it could give to the whole facial structure, if you're going to look again at the face, it changes the appearance of the face of the patient. So, um, yeah. If I may just, yeah. All right, so here's another case. I think, I think it's a lot to do with the chin prominence. Uh, the chin prominence. Chin prominence yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you, you get, yes, absolutely. That gives you a very good frontal view. And not just the profile. Yeah, and the directions by which their muscles would stretch after uh, the the relationship of the or insertion and origin of the muscles after the or reorientation of the maxillary mandibular relationship, this one gives a better appearance to your smile. And um, another, uh, this is another case, and uh, uh, for this one, this is an iatrogenic uh, case, and this one began with. Uh, 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 the history of this patient, basically, she already finished her orthodontic treatment as evidenced by the uh, evident in the lower arch. And um, it was a specialist who treated this patient. However, uh, the patient felt some sort of pain a uh, few months after the treatment, and she went to another dentist. And with this dentist, what was done was she uh, was fitted with a splint. Does and she have a cleft? The... Is this is a cleft? She also has a cleft. Oh, yeah. You missed <laughs> um, out that. <laughs> well, I'm talking on a different spectrum, but oh, yeah. that's the bonus part. Um, I want you guys also to look at the cleft on how we're going to close this cleft. Uh, but we, since we're talking on vertical delusion, um, so this is an open bite, and we're just looking inside the mouth that uh, was fitted with uh, the split. impact. You know, some Does she have a cleft? That, okay, you can this place your brackets at a higher uh, level. Um, some would say you can place inter arch elastics on your anterior. Some would say you um, that. place some bends <laughs> on your <laughs> wire. Well, I mean, I'm talking on a different spectrum, but that's the bonus <laughs> point. And I intruded the posterior, and I had to restore again the uh, the lower um, the lower back to its maxillomandibular proper maxillomandibular relationship. And um, by intrusion, and as you can see, I didn't place anything on the lower because I wanted to prove to uh, to myself that uh, this is going to auto rotate upward and forward without any uh, intervention on the lower. And as evidenced by a few months of treatment, it rotated upward and forward, and you have somewhat uh, a little bit of a difference from the canine relationship. So from this point, this is where I'm trying to look for the cause of the temporal mandibular joint disorder and um, Primarily, we found it in the uh, wrong um, uh, relationship or proportion with the upper, and that's brought about by the cleft. And at this point, uh, we were able to close the cleft. Uh, no more um, exposure, no surgery, no um, no grafting, just purely ortho, moving teeth, uh, moving bone into that empty space, and uh, pulling it back uh, with moving the tooth through the bone. And as you can see, we did some extraction for the lower and also uh, an, uh, another for the upper, which was kind of painful for me. Um, mm. And there, so we were able to collapse it, we were able to close it, and uh, I, it was still insufficient as far as my intrusion, uh, uh, my TPA could give me. So I added an implant here, uh, which uh, Dr. Addis uh, gifted me at that time. <laughs> as you can see, it's right there. Uh, I, I used that to intrude further and flatten this occlusal plane and um, come up with this very good interdigitation or maxillomandibular relationship. And this uh, kind of treatment does not uh, constitute any, um, um, like I said, uh, relative modes of treatment, as I said, in that algorithm. So this is an absolute approach in terms of uh, fixing this occlusion. Yeah. The very interesting so part I, over here is how you close the cleft. I mean, because there's no bone over there. So you ran the canine once and, and, you, and you ran it back. So it's back and forth yeah. to gain bone. Uh, there. Yeah. It's all tissue reaction. Um, when you're moving teeth at a very slow, uh, continuous rate, you bring the bone into that space. That's what I did. And then I pulled it back with a very high force mm -hmm. to run the tooth through the bone and thereby leaving some bone in that area for the anteriors to retract. And um, that's how I was able to close that cleft. So uh, 
Um, from the posteriors as well, uh, you can see that the uh, I overcorrected my posteriors. It's now a posterior open bite, but that's okay if you have a, a, a posterior open, I mean, an anterior open bite to start with, which was caused primarily by your posteriors. And uh, I, I think I saw, I, I showed this case last week, and this is the, the pseudo class two kind of relationship. Um, it's just an intrusion on the posteriors. Uh, caused this uh, authorization of the mandible from a class two. And I said a while ago that the misconception of class two canines, you know, most of us would treat this patient by extracting maybe an upper premolar. But um, in some cases, you know what, it, it just entails the intrusion of the upper posteriors and cause a mandibular rotation going upward and forward. As you would note, I didn't bond my second molars. And the reason why um, is that for this patient, she was still young. She was 16 years old at that time that we started and we ended around um, 17 or somewhere around 18. But uh, at that certain age, these uh, second molars freshly come out. And when they freshly come out, they're usually in that good orientation in terms of uh, your muscles and how these structures are, uh, are agreeing with one another when it comes to occlusal adaptation or occlusal development um, in your posteriors. So I used my second molars as a reference point to intrude my first molars all the way up to that level. I get it. Uh, hey, uh, Dr. Pao, uh, let me just ask you a question, please. I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure out exactly. Uh, could you go back to your previous slide? Because that is an excellent uh, example of auto rotation. Mm -hmm. So what, what my point over here is, uh, what is your guideline for auto rotation, extraction, and do you base it, like for example, I'm just giving an example. You have an edge to edge canine and you have an overjet of say about four millimeters, right? So what is the role of the profile, lip, mm -hmm. incisor, inclination and ang angulation in your treatment modality? Are you going to, irrespective of all of these, the, uh, auto rotate the mandible? Uh, and when do you give up on the auto rotation uh, and just extract, or would you do both in conjunction? Oh. Well, again, I'll go back uh, and use my uh, mini aesthetics as my basis. Um, your lower facial third, if it's uh, quite long, um, longer than your uh, upper facial third, then that would be a basis for me to go uh, to use to utilize intrusion of the posterior. Uh, call, uh, in, um, to utilize mandibular rotation to shorten that lower facial height. Mm -hmm. Now, when I reach that point that I am already in that lower facial, uh, ideal lower facial height, and still I have this kind of sagittal relationship. If I have this kind of relationship in a, um, in a low or normal lower facial height, then definitely this will be an extraction case, uh, irrespective of whatever the step would say. Okay, so, that is uh, that is like understandable, of course, because you have auto rotated the mandible and still you're on a class two. But what if you've auto rotated the mandible, corrected the class two to absolute class one, and now you feel that the patient is biprotrusive again? So now instead of the upper four, which you would have done in the very beginning, you would have to do all four. four. Yeah. That's it, right? Yeah. Okay. That's that's exactly what I was coming to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, but 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 the best but the good part over here is at least you've corrected the mandibular plane while doing so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, and I think I also showed you this case last week, uh, something similar to what you're saying uh, in terms of the relationship of the initial relationship of the canines and how uh, mandibular rotation affected or changed that canine relationship. Uh, you can get significant amount of sagittal relationship changes in just by merely intrusion of your upper uh, second mo uh, first molars. And as you can see here, we intruded the first molar. Okay, we didn't place mm -hmm. anything on the second molar because I wanted to use that as my reference point before I place anything. So placing something over there would cause reciprocal action, and it might super up the second molar, and it might screw up. Uh, a whole lot more. Absolutely. I'm going to show an animation in a very short while. Okay. So another standpoint would be um, uh, this is a relative movement, and this basically is a. Uh, uh, it looks like a class two, 
Um, uh, but this patient had a very strong uh, lip structure from the anteriors. Um, so as we started to level the line, we were able to see that this patient was actually a, a class three. You're going to see it. Here it goes. When, you're, when uh, the patient was being leveled in line, so initially I used my RCS to uh, somewhat try, try to change the, inter, I mean, the occlusal plane uh, and in combination with a uh, interarch elastics. But then um, I had to change my treatment approach um, to a multiple edgewise arch wire. Mm -hmm. okay. This one. Okay. Now, when it comes to vertical uh, movements, we have to understand that um, this one would actually, this could work nicely with patients who have low, uh, low to normal uh, vertical heights. Um, lo uh, low to normal, yeah, vertical yeah, angle. Lower vertical. Um, but if you're using this in high angle patients, uh, there's a little bit of a danger there by you might increase or you might maintain the long lower facial height. But um, I would say that in class three patients, that's a whole other story when it comes to lower facial height because structurally, basically, you're going against something that is uh, structurally or anatomically long. So I use the uh, multiple edgewise arch wire to change the occlusal plane. And um, uh, basically, we were able to retract, but um, without... Um, so much of a change in the uh, vertical. So, uh, so here's the um, uh, animation now. So you you have a occlusal plane like this, and uh, sometimes you know with the use of these interarch elastics, we tend to change these occlusal planes, and we think that we're not creating any difference in terms of the maxillomandibular relationship. Um, this is the effect on a class three elastic, I suppose. Somewhat, yeah. And then uh, this next one would be for the class two elastic. Absolutely. And you can change the occlusal plane. You can soften your wire. You can uh, um, use very low uh, forces uh, and um, long elastics in order for you to create these kinds of vectors. Now, if um, let's say that all the forces are happening in an ideal situation. Uh, and the, the bone is reacting in a way that the maxillomandibular relationship isn't being botched up, well, then this one could be uh, a good kind of treatment for some patients. But when you're treating adult patients, uh, most of the time, the reality of the situation would be that your mandibles are actually rotating um, downward and backward as well like this and causing some kind of uh, difference in the relationship of your maxillomandibular relationship, okay? It changes your maxillomandibular relationship, but it still gives you a good look inside the mouth. So for these kinds of situations, you lengthen the lower, I mean, you lengthen, uh, you increase this vertical angle. You also have that tendency to increase the lower facial height, which could lead to an aesthetic botch up or sometimes even to a functional botch up. It's very true. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, yeah. Dr. Dr. Bahra Hana has a question. Uh, can you explain further how intrusion can correct the class two relationship? Oh, okay. So your mandible moves in a uh, in a rotational. I, I think I should go on to the next segment here, um, which is a vertical anchorage delusion. And uh, let's say, for example, and this is consistent with the previous cases. Okay, so uh, I don't want to talk about class one, two, or three cases. Uh, in the angle um, kind of classification. What I want to talk about is something like this. Loss of lower six, 80% of uh, Dr. Addis patients are like this. 80% of my patients are also like this. These are my favorite cases. And usually, okay, this is the actual representation. So you see that there's a difference, a significant difference in terms of what the loss of lower six actually is versus what it actually appears to be. This one is an easy case, no vertical issues. Just close the space, initialize, don't cause any uh, disruption. You're usually gonna catch patients like this in a very early stage. But what if the patient, which is usually the situation, they leave it all behind? I mean, they, they just, you know, they don't get any prosthetics, they don't get any orthodontic treatment. This is what usually happens. Upper six would super erupt. Lower sixes, lower sevens will initially tip. Upper sevens will also super up, and usually you get the class two carries in between your fours and your sixes. And the interesting thing here is that if you look again, class one canine relationship, 
and then loss of lower six and that posterior collapse creates this rotation of the jaw downward and backward. And this is the normal movement of your jaw. You, you put something in between it, it goes downward and backward. You remove yeah. something in between it, it goes upward and forward. And that's what we want to revolve around here. So now uh, speaking about class two cases, like real class two cases, not class two loss of lower six, I would contest that um, intrusion of your upper sixes will not be the solution for the fixation of your uh, canine classification. I think that would require a, a, um, a an appliance, an orthodontic appliance or some kind of training or maybe a surgical uh, intervention to protrude uh, the mandible. Um, but in certain cases, uh, which is most of the time, it, it's like this. And uh, as presented, it usually presents itself like this. And again, like I said last time in the episode two, these canines, to me, are in an asymmetric position. Uh, in a, the mandible is in a deflected position, downward and backward, because of the interference coming from the posterior. Remove that interference. You're, you allow your mandible to autorotate upward and forward, and you change it. So let me show you with these animations the um, uh, modality of treatment. Okay, so your patients would appear somewhat like this, from mild, moderate to even severe. And these cases are like, they're, they're I mean, almost all cases are like this. I mean, in, in third world countries, especially. Um, in well-developed countries, you, you won't really see these kinds of issues. Uh, the other day, I because saw, of the uh, fact because of the fact that the oral hygiene is far better, premature losses of sixes don't occur, and because of the premature loss of six, you don't have the the follow-up uh, sequel uh, as you discussed, right? You won't have the mesial tipping of the sevens, and you're not going to have the bite opening effect. You won't have the rotation of the mandible downward, backward, and you can you can omit many many uh, harmful sequel. To the loss of sixes so now the the problem is when the patients come in like this you don't really see the before and after of your lower jaw and you only see what's existent so it's hard to say that okay this one autoritated but uh one of the areas that we can look into as a proof that this one autoritated is if you look at the level of the first molar versus the second molar usually your first molars are going to be super erupted in comparison to your second molar or even your third molar. So we have to uh, observe that part because that is not a normal occurrence. Again, uh, a normal occlusion would entail about a flat occlusal plane with um, nothing uh, super erupting above the initial occlusal plane. So let me jump into this and answer that question. Um, if you look here, okay, so uh, we have two cases here. And I want to talk about this one on the left side of the screen, and this is the relative vertical anchorage where we think that we don't need TPAs, we don't need TADs, TAD, we don't want TADs. I mean, here uh, in this place, there's a lot of dentists who don't like to use TADs, one, because they, the, their patients won't pay, and two, uh, some of them are afraid or adamant to, uh, to place anything. So uh, they try to, to fix this case in a relative fashion, and they use the teeth, and again, it's reciprocal force, and here's the effect if you look closely. You level the line in the occlusal plane and actually you increase the lower facial height. You, you can see inside yes. the mouth that this is a straight dentition. Oh, maybe I can remove my brackets, but then if you look at the lower facial height, then that's what's going to impact. So you have to look inside the mouth, look in the mini aesthetics, look inside the mouth, and then look back in the mini aesthetics if it's actually benefiting. So as far as straightening up the teeth, this is very easy. But then putting it in the proper position, which I'm going to talk about later, um, well, we, okay, I went ahead of myself. Okay, so, um, so when we reach this kind of um, uh, position, what we, the next thing we do is, oh, we're still in a class two canine relationship. What we do is we extract the first premolar and then we kind of uh, do some sort of space consolidation and then consolidate in this like this. And it seems correct again inside the mouth, which is a, I would say a delusion. And uh, the right way to fix this is actually to fix your maximum-mandibular relationship. We're not called orthodontists for no reason. I mean, you fix teeth, yeah, but you also have to fix the bone. So um, with the methods that we're av that's available, this is the same scenario that we showed you. And here's the right approach if you're going to ask me when it comes to situations like this, where initially the patient was an actual class one, and then they just 
went into a class too, just because of these uh, uh, author rotation. You have to place a tab here in this segment here in this orange dot, and you have to intrude your upper posteriors and your lower anteriors. As I showed you uh, before, that when you lose when you lose your lower six, your upper six supra erupts because it's trying to look for an opposing, and the oblique structure of your periodontal ligament makes it supra erupt. The loss of the bone in between the, six, the seven and the five would cause the collapse of the seven and thereby cause a tipping. And also for your anteriors, because of the premature contact developed here, they would try to adopt and they would also super erupt. So it's not only an intrusion of the upper posterior, but also an intrusion in the anterior. So let me show you. So this is an interarch perspective. Okay, let me go back again. Interarch perspective, I'm going to give you another perspective. You intrude the upper posterior, intrude the lower anterior. And this is what you get, and you fix the maxillomandibular relationship to the proper por uh, proportion. Okay, here's another um, uh, another perspective: intra arch only, intrusion of the upper six, intrusion of the lower six. That's how it's supposed to look like. And then the mandible is going to be able to freely rotate upward and forward because of the removal of the interference in between the upper contact. and the lower causing your mandible to rotate upward and forward into a class one. So it's not only a forward movement. Again, it's a forward movement. That's why when you refer to the movements of the jaw, which we talked about last time, it's counterclockwise, it's clockwise. It's not only going down, it's not only going up, it's also moving upward and forward and also downward and backward. So after that, basically what you do is you, um, you fix that space, you manage that space, may uh, extract the eight maybe much more earlier to get substantial intrusion in the posteriors. And basically that's how uh, it could go well. So um, if I'm a, I, I can continue, right? All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, okay. So uh, with this- we have, case, a, we, have a, we have a small question uh, from yeah. uh, Dr. Ivy Chang. Yeah. Uh, how do you measilize sevens in missing six cases with control. Oh, Todd. Oh, I, I think you're talking about molar try. protraction, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a crazy I, stuff. I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be talking about that. I'm gonna be talking about that. Yeah. I would say Tad's only. I mean, I think mm -hmm. you're you're gonna show some evidence of some butt chops. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is a this is actually a, a case of visualization of the seven, and I want to show you how uh, I botched this up. So I got this when I was still studying, and that upper six was basically uh, there's a class two because of the um, uh, super eruption and it caused a lot of food impaction in that area. Super eruption, classic loss of lower six, and um, uh, the the system that the plan that I had for this patient was to restore it. So this one was uh, post uh, RCT, and then this one was the crown. And I said when I saw the crown, I said I was surprised because the crown was a little bit too long. And I think they were trying to inter, uh, I mean, interrelate the upper and lower. So I didn't need that. So um, now I was kind of lazy at that time. So I didn't put anything. This was long, long back. And this is where you're going to see, I'm trying to retract my anterior segment first. Yeah, because I extracted the upper first premolar. So it's going to look like my sevens are initializing, but actually it's my, my anteriors that are distalizing. But then after Very that, true. I have a good canine relationship already. And then I, I needed to protract. So I did a shortcut and this is what I did. I placed a class uh, two elastic on, on my interarch uh, on my uh, loop over there. Some of you might ask what's the use of that helix. Basically it's for a longer loop. I, I did it for fun when I was still younger. So that was the, uh, the movement. So as you can see the different, oh goodness. As you can see the difference between um, uh, this part where I initialized it, okay you would be able to see that um, I actually caused an interference over here. The bite is still closed. And actually, it's almost like a deep bite. But then after the pure, I um, mean, more protraction, which I used this TADS, uh, we had a premature contact here, which I was not able to detect. I didn't really care about it. I didn't look at it because I had this, um, this canine relationship that I thought was favorable. And this uh, overbite overjet I, was, I thought was favorable. So, um, but looking at the posteriors, I had this uh, eight and it looks like this. And I used this kind of uh, lever arm or auxiliary arm. And basically um, this is what happens in the animation. 
Okay. I was able to initialize that. And then I only use this kind of, and it upgraded that way. Now, the funny thing about this patient was he was absolutely non-compliant. Actually, he still owes me some money. I think every, most of you would relate to that. Uh, but um, I placed this about a year ago. and I mean, uh, a year ago before this one. As you can, uh, I, I told this patient, please come back again next month because I, 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 I'm not pretty sure about what's gonna happen here. I don't want to increase anything furthermore. So uh, like in his old fashion, he doesn't come back and he comes back a year after. Look at the brackets over here. That looks like a year after. Maybe after this uh, coronavirus is done, our patients would look like this. Hopefully not. <laughs> oh my but God. But then I was very lucky that after a year, this uh, tooth um, stood up like that without any vertical um, problems. So luckily, your four systems were absolutely determinate, and you exactly had calculated the cantilever size in order to not uh, botch up that. Uh, because I, I, if 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 this was done wrongly, you would have had a lot of distal tipping. You would have had a mesial supra eruption of the cusps, creating another another issue altogether. I think if, uh, for some people, they might ask that: What if you use a reverse curve over here, or a straight plane, uh, a straight, a plain straight arch wire, or night eye, so you can upright that too? Well, the problem is uh, that if you create anything, any change on this occlusal plane, and some factors would happen here, like an intrusion of the seven, uh, intrusion of the five and the four, and then super eruption, you're going to create an accentuation here, and it might cause a different maxillary mandibular relationship. Mm -hmm. I was trying to preserve what's ever happening here in the anteriors, uh, not to be botched up by uh, the leveling of this uh, tooth over here. It makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. And uh, I think that this is the last case that I have. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is what we were talking about last night, uh, scissor bites, uh, who um, basically <clears throat> look like this, right? And yeah. for these kinds of patients, there's no choice but to place a bite block. But again, like I said, I do not like uh bite blocks and as far as i could stretch it and i think that's one of the reasons why i'm treating this patient for so long is because uh i i have this struggle of um uh, of putting anything on the lower but as you can see my approach here is i place a tad here on the palatal so that's not only going to intrude but that's also going to move the teeth palatally constrict um, the arch yeah constrict the arch and uh for the upper we were able to get a better relationship for the lower, there was some passive movement coming from this tooth over here. Uh, and then uh, we had to do a lot of super, I mean, uprighting for this uh, tooth over here on your 4-8. So this was a botch up from the start. And uh, like we said, I think uh, three, two, uh, two episodes ago, the hardest to correct is not the natural malocclusion, but rather the iatrogenic malocclusion available. So, so we um, have we have we have a few questions, uh, Dr. Corina Netku. Uh, is it a TMA cantilever for upgrading the eight? No, it's a stainless steel cantilever. So I don't understand Spanish, but there is a question in Spanish. I'm very sorry. You will have to translate that. Okay, so that's about that. So uh, I'm 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 going to be moving in to the next segment. I think I'll have to share my screen now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Pao has raised a very, very important question as to what would happen if you just run a straight wire in the arch, right? Uh, so, I'm, I'm going to be. I I'm going to have answer. to play your presentation. Pardon? Play your presentation. Play. Okay. I'm very sorry. Yeah. Is it is it visible now? Okay, so there is this very, very interesting paper uh, in uh, AJO as well as uh, EJO uh, in which it is very clear that, uh, now I want everybody to understand this, uh, that if a patient comes into your office and if the patient is a high angle or a low angle, now, depending on that, how important is it to uh, identify uh is it is it okay to just put in a straight night eye inside because most of the patients have a curve of speed right uh nobody has a very flat occlusal plane i mean they, they have some kind of a curve of speed uh and as uh, one of uh, the participants asked 
what would happen if you just place a straight wire inside? What is the effect on the molars, right? So data and evidence suggests that on a high angle case, if you place a straight night eye, that is a preformed night eye in, what happens is not what you want. So in a high angle, how would you want the, the, the curve of speed to flatten? In a high angle, you would definitely want intrusion of incisors to take place and not extrusion of molars, right? Because that would increase the plane more. But unfortunately, evidence has suggested that if you place a wire as night eye on a high angle case, what happens is the molars extrude to flatten the curve. That is detrimental to whatever you want. And the exact opposite happens on a low angle. So on a low angle, you would want, you know, you'd never want extrusion of the molars though, because that's unstable, but yes, you could use some early elastics and stuff. But what happens is if you place a straight night eye on a low angle, you're not going to get any effect on the molars, but what happens is your incisors procline and intrude to flatten the curve speed. That's exactly not what, not what you want in a low angle case, but unfortunately that's what happens. So what is the significance of the paper? The significance is that if you have a high angle and you have a curve of speed, it is better to use an intrusion arch on the lower or tads on the lower to actively start intruding the incisors and not let the posteriors erupt. So it's better to leave the posteriors where they are, go in for a segmented approach, use a three-piece arch or a one-piece intrusion arch and intrude the lower incisors actively before the posteriors erupt to flatten the curve of speed using a flat wire. Similarly, on a low angle case, it would be beneficial to start using some early elastics, uh, class two elastics or so on, in order to help the eruption of the posteriors uh, and, and not let the anteriors flare and intrude actively. With that in mind, we're gonna start with the intrusion arches. So this is a very clear demonstration of intrusion arches. As you can see, this is a one piece intrusion arch. The one piece technically means that the intrusion arch is in one piece, but the segments are still divided into three. Uh, now there are two ways of engaging it. You can either engage the main uh, intrusion arch into the bracket slot, or you can just pull it down and tie it at two different points, uh, keeping a, a base arch over here between the laterals. Now, uh, this is a very interesting pick I've taken from Dr. Vishnu Raj. Uh, this is an example of how he uses an intrusion arch. Now, this is answering another question, by the way, is how he uh, retracts uh, while uh, placing an intrusion arch. Now, if ever I've had uh, a case in which the incisors are not very proclined with a deep bite kind of a system, I would go in for intrusion while retraction, right? So I have already answered the question. Now there are very, very many different ways of correcting this case. One way would definitely be using an intrusion arch while retracting instead of actually placing a third implant over here. As I've already explained in the first uh, case, you can just even torque the wire. And I have already demonstrated substantial amount of intrusion just by torquing the wire in the anterior segment while retracting it. And the third way would be to use a three-piece intrusion arch. I mean, you could even use a three-piece intrusion arch as I'm gonna be showing you in, a, uh, in, the, in the next uh, couple of slides. So this is the design and the wire is uh, 17 by 25 TMA. Uh, intrusion arches are usually made in TMA wires. Now, the reciprocal effect is going to be seen on the molars. You will have extrusion at the molar area when using an intrusion arch. And the only way you can counter this is by using a transpalatal bar, which is going to maintain the vertical position uh, of your molars whilst retracting it uh, using an intrusion arch as well. So that's one. And uh, this is on the lower. So you can see this is an example of uh, uh, a, a one piece intrusion arch with three segments. As you can see that the intrusion arch has been ligated a distal to the lateral incisor on both sides. And this is how the lower incisors are being intruded. So as I have mentioned, this may be a high angle case, right? 
because you do if, if you would have placed a night eye running straight from here going up over here and going down you would want this to go down but that doesn't happen because of the musculature and all the effects in a high angle this is going to come up and that's bad for the case because once this comes up you rotated the mandible already downward and backward so it's better to use segments over here actively intrude get it into a lower position and then engage a continuous arch wire now this is usually how i do it i use a one piece intrusion arch but i don't give the bends i just place them from the auxiliary slot of the molars and this is just a night eye it's a very straight night eye and i give a tip back on the night eye itself so i give a tip back over here so this is the active uh, in inactive position of the wire it's somewhere over here it's it's running here and you just pull it up and you tie it at two points the three segments have they're segmented they're not uh, a, a continuous arch wire and as you can see the uh, patient is a high angle and the anteriors have been extruded uh, so this is relative intrusion and retraction simultaneously you can see a power chain going here to a hook which i have fabricated uh, distal to the canines as well so retraction and intrusion taking place simultaneously but the issue over here is my molar because i don't have any control on the molars and the molars are going to extrude so i need to control that the better way would be placing tads over here and i will show you a case where i've done that the same thing using tads as well uh, many of you have already seen this case but i'm just going to run through this case quicker now because of the side effects on the molars uh, and in this particular case uh, this is this is a case of ext uh, extraction of uh, upper force uh and when i got the case uh, it was a deep bite and uh, there was very little overjet pattern and tipping of the incisors had taken place and definitely an anterior dental extrusion kind of a scenario uh so uh, uh i had no option i mean i couldn't in, i couldn't retract uh, at the same time because i didn't have any overjet so in this case i've i've used uh, an implant over here and a modified one piece intrusion arch running from the implant straight high up uh, the key over here is the uh, slots in the implant have to be pointed in the same direction and can't be at different directions because you're going to have a canted uh, uh, intrusion arch and uh, you also have to be careful that the left side mini screw is going to be activated in the opposite direction in the counterclockwise direction which is going to lose in it so if you have substantial amount of play between the slot over here and the wire dimension you're safe but if you have a snug fit there is a chance that this is going to lose it so abso anchor has the left handed mini screws in case you want to use this kind of mechanics and i push it down intruded now as you could see in dr vishnu raj's case uh, he had intruded as well as uh, uh, retracted using a intrusion arch from the molar auxiliary slot i have done the same but i've used the implant over here so it's a fail safe mechanics right there's no effect on the molar there's no extrusion at the level of the molars and the implants are taking up all the burden so i'm retracting as well as intruding simultaneously and you can see that the intrusion has taken place and the canines have gone back into a class 1 signifying the amount of extra uh, retraction you could go and uh, see this particular case uh, in uh, ijo it's a uh, mini mini implant supported avg intrusion arch uh yeah so now the effect uh, again on a similar case it's an iatrogenically damaged case as you can see that uh, this particular case uh, in the beginning would have been a 4 by 4 extraction but when i got it you can see the amount of curve of spear over here you see the severe severe curve of spear uh, uh, extrusion of the lower anteriors has taken place and uh, uh, because of forces because of high amount of forces on very very light wires what has happened is the anteriors have extruded and absolutely tipped back and there is absolutely no uh, uh, going back from this case because you need to you need to now really think about it and correct it in all dimensions the uppers have extruded and uh, and, 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 and as you notice there is a 100% deep bite as well over here right so you can clearly see the increased overjet the overjet has increased and you can see a very very severe anterior extrusion now this is all because of extractions and retractions on light wires this is a typical roller coaster effect that you would you would you would notice now 
I think I've mentioned it wrong in one of the uh, previous things. I, I myself forgotten. I, I haven't used the reverse curve in this, but I have uh, actually performed uh, intrusion now uh, of the anteriors. So what I want to uh, what I want to specify over here is that I've placed implants at the back in order to retract. Uh, in this, I wanted to flatten the curve of SPI. As you can see, she is a high angle case, and as we have discussed. A high angle case always would need intrusion of the anteriors rather than extrusion of the posteriors. So the anteriors have intruded, but not automatically. I have placed an intrusion arch with the help of lower tads. So you can see the lower tads have been placed over here. And this is a preformed wire uh, just going down, pulled up, activated at two particular points over here. And you can see the difference in the first and the second. You can see the retroclination on the first uh, and the lower anteriors. And you can see that the incisors are uprighting. At the same time, I'm intruding the uh, lower, uh, the upper anteriors using mini screws uh, and retracting them simultaneously. The other way around this would be placing two mini screws uh, over here and intruding at the same time. But unfortunately, it's, it's very, very difficult and very hard to place mini screws at this particular position because of the gingival uh, impingement and as well as the growth of the gums over it. Uh, uh, one, of, one, of my, uh, one of the seniors in, um, uh, in India here, yeah, Dr. Vivek Patni has developed his own system and he uses uh, symphysal implants over here with the help of something called the noni hook, uh, which which, which really sticks out and you could use that as intrusive uh, uh, vectors. So pretty interesting, but I avoid placing mini screws in the lower anterior area. I prefer placing them on the uppers, but on the lowers, I would always go in for uh, an intrusion arch, an intrusion, uh, a one piece intrusion arch. Uh, that's, that's definitely gonna be easier. So as you can see, this is the case now. Uh, the curve of speed has been flattened more by the intrusion of the anteriors, lower anteriors. And you can see the change. This is the change just in about one year. So this is how it was. You can see the curve of speed going really high. And now you can see the curve of speed, which is almost flat. Intrusion of the incisors mm -hmm. have taken place. And it's in a pretty better, pretty much uh, controllable situation than uh, compared to how it was in the beginning. Now, a three-piece intrusion arch is definitely much more uh, in the controlled way. Uh, I'm going to be demonstrating. You can see the three-piece intrusion arch has its anterior arms somewhere at the center of resistance, which gives you a very good intrusive vector. You can also, at the same time, retract. You can retract uh, using a power chain. So the net force is retraction and intrusion. Uh, now, this is an example of an intrusion arch, a three-piece intrusion arch, where you can see the anterior segment, the posterior segment, and uh, you can also uh, appreciate the amount of intrusive vector, especially when you look at such mechanics, right? Cumbersome to make, definitely, yes. So I don't usually go in for a three-piece intrusion arch. I would prefer placing implants over there. Now, there was a very interesting study which came out of India in the Journal of Orthodontics. Uh, it, it compares the conventional methods of simultaneous intrusion retraction uh, using, um, and, and the comparison is between a Kaser arch wire, that's the Calra simultaneous intrusion and retraction arch wire, versus a three piece intrusion arch. So the findings are very, very clear. You see, the amount of intrusion that you get with a three piece intrusion arch is considerably more. The amount of bodily movement you gain with a three piece intrusion arch is considerably more. But when it comes to an anchorage aspect, you lose more anchorage on a three-piece intrusion arch compared to that of any other uh, retractive uh, arch wires. Now, a KSR arch wire definitely is going to have a little less loss of anchorage because of the increased throwback on the molars. You have a 45-degree gable and then an additional 60-degree bend from there on, which is really just distally tipping the molars too much. Uh, so, of course, you're going to have less amount of uh, 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 anchorage loss but it's too much of attention on the premolars and the molars. Uh, so uh, with this in mind, what I decided was uh, a three piece has more control. So let's modify it. And this is the case that I've already uh, touched upon. And uh, again, you can see that this case uh, was a retreatment case. 
uh, canines uh, somewhere halfway. I've used this mechanics over here, as I've mentioned before, independent retraction of the canines of the anteriors. So this is just a modification of the three-piece intrusion arch. Now, instead of the intrusion arch wires, I've used implants with with the uh, power chains over here, which is going to give me the same amount of control, right? Uh, so, and it's even faster uh, because of uh, the frictionless movement. So, as you can see, I was able to close the spaces very, very quickly in just about four to five months. And uh, as you can see over here, I placed a 1725 or I, I think an 1825 night eye to upright the roots with long power chains over here so that I don't open up these spaces. Now, uh, I was able to get a decent amount of finish and now I'm going to get to the question of retention when, when it comes to vertical increase. So intrusion would need a proper retentive protocol. So what I, what I tend to do is I place the uh, F-fixed retainers and then I also give an S-X retainer. Now the S-X retainer has an incorporated lingual button. Now the lingual button over here is going and, and and i ask the patients to wear very light elastics three by 16 light elastics uh to actively uh to to passively uh maintain the intrusion and not let the segment extrude i maintain the implant over here for the next i, I think i'm going to maintain it for about two years or one year uh, it, it really doesn't cause much harm though you can see that i've gained us a good amount of intrusion and retraction simultaneously. So this is a modification of the three-piece intrusion arch. So again, I'm going to I'm going to conclude the intrusion arch segment over here by saying that I would use a one-piece intrusion arch if the lower anteriors are upright and not very flared, because a one-piece intrusion arch would not give you a very good control on the in the AP direction. Uh, but a three-piece intrusion arch is going is far better if you have proclined lower incisors, uh, extrusion along with proclined lower incisors, because that is going to give you a far better control on the central resistance part of it. I do not prefer using intrusion arches on the uppers uh, because I have uh, I, I can easily place tads over there and and get the same mechanics done with tads than place those intrusion arches. Uh, so that's that's that for the particular. Uh, uh, segment on intrusion arches. So, Dr. Paul, any questions? Well, um, none of right, none as of right now. Uh, but uh, I just like to um, uh, add on that in terms of the uh, uh, the segmental arches. And segmental arches, it it actually requires some skills. Some people might want to ask, uh, is that even necessary? Um, is, is that an overkill? Uh, does that actually make life much more easier? I think I want to come from a standpoint where orthodontics really isn't easy. It's not as simple as our manufacturers would portray it and say that, you know, it's simple way, it's simple way. Simple according to what? And, and uh, intrusion per se is something that doesn't happen naturally. Distalization is something that doesn't happen naturally. So um, overriding some situations with uh, segmental approaches would actually make uh, the objective um, of the treatment come faster than it would if we used a straight wire. And um, uh, the thing is that when, when you're thinking about the statically determinate system and the statically indeterminate system, an indeterminate system would be that of a straight wire where you just place your arch wire and just allow it to uh, straighten out your teeth while a uh, um, a statically determinate system would be something that you're going to be much more intentional. Yes, it requires a lot more uh, work, but then treatment objectives uh, are, are reached quite faster in a sense that uh, you, you're much more intentional. Uh, you're not doing, uh, you're doing multiple movements in one step. Uh, it's time consuming within the treatment, but then it's actually not time consuming uh, inter-treatment. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and then the it's it's the other way around for statically indeterminate system. It's uh, not time consuming intra treatment, but then it's time consuming inter treatment. And um, yes, it requires a lot of skill. Um, Dr. Georgia Forelli and Dr. Bertie Melsons are like the they're, they're the experts in this field. Um, Burstone also has a a, a good um, uh, mechanics in his book, and you can open that. Uh, much of my uh, much of our 
um, segmental treatments uh, actually came from Birchstone. Uh, would you say so? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But, um, this is another approach. Uh, what we're trying to say here is that this is another approach. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of bot shops that you get when you, um, uh, a lot of bot shops when you do the statically indeterminate system. And basically our, our way of uh, telling you not to step on that banana peel is by, um, by you know, not, mm -hmm. not, uh, not doing it in a statically indeterminate system, but rather doing it in a determinate system. So let's go to the question. Uh, from Dr. Marco Grugerich, do you do phrenectomy before inserting miniscrew between upper central incisors? Uh, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't find the need to do that because I place them uh, slightly away from the frenum and uh, my the necks, the, the, the implant that I use, they have very long necks. Yeah. And uh, so they don't usually create much issues over there. I don't, I don't particularly do any kind of uh, phrenectomy. Okay. And next question, which is a good question from Dr. Carla uh, Obida Gipaya. Is there other method for retaining the intrusion aside from putting a TAD? So if I have already placed a TAD for the purpose of intrusion, I wouldn't take it out. Yep. But in case I've used an intrusion arch, as I've shown, in that case, I would probably go in for a retainer which has a bite plate, anterior bite plate over there, which would retain the anterior amount, anterior intrusion. Would Essex um, retainers uh, substantiate that purpose? No, I don't think so. I, I don't okay. think so. I mean, I, I have never done it that way. I, I use uh, the ones with the uh, incisal bite plates. Okay. Um, Holly appliances, big wrapper up, absolutely not because they have no vertical control. Um, so, okay. Um, next question. I think, I, think, I, yeah. think, I think I've seen uh, some Damon practitioners leave the bite turbos there. Uh-huh. Yeah, and, that and that, yeah, so that, that acts as a retentive feature as well. You could do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So from Dr. Bada, uh, Hannah, what about the amount of force you use for intrusion and retraction and how that affect root resorption? Okay. So intrusion and root resorption have a very direct correlation. Uh, let me clarify this. If you use... A, too much force while intrusion, you're definitely going to get a lot of root resorption. But root resorption is more, uh, it's, it's more responsive to third order activations. So torquing is a more important culprit when it comes to root resorption compared to just up and down movements, right? Uh, the amount of force that I use uh, for retraction when it comes to segments is about... Uh, I would, I would just put it about 150 grams of force per side uh, on both sides. Uh, and uh, intrusion, mm -hmm. I would go for about, if I'm using two mini screws, uh, I would use about 30 grams of force per mini screw. And if I'm just using one mini screw, I would just put about say 50 grams of force on that mini screw. Okay. Um... I don't think and and by the way, I, 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 I prefer using I prefer using those uh, square threads or the power threads because they give you very light force, no matter how 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 tight you tie them, right? They give you the least amount of uh, force. Power yep. chains sometimes tend to exaggerate the force. Open coil springs, I, I very seldom use them. I don't use them much. Uh -huh. uh, coil springs are kind of boring in terms of uh, the, the time that they treat patients. <laughs> Uh, okay, so another question from Dr. Vikram Ji Singh. How uh, we can avoid the failures of that? Oh, well, that's okay, another, so now that's, uh, that's, that's another uh, topic in itself. So how can you avoid failure in TADS? I mean, uh, 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 I, can, I can say that I have, if I've placed, uh, I've placed a lot of TADS, I think I have about, say, 10% uh, failure or maybe a 15%, 10 to 15%, somewhere, somewhere there. Uh, of uh, percent failure in my uh, TAD positionings. I would, I would firstly say that a TAD would fail because of uh, lack of uh, stability, lack of primary stability itself. That means you've placed it in the wrong position. The bone quality matters a lot. Uh, number two is the gingival inflammation, uh, food lodgement, which uh, does not let the secondary stability get in and causes inflammation, which, which would cause it to loosen up itself. And the third would be excessive forces. Uh, um, I mean, a TAD is not meant to use, uh, to be loaded more than 500 grams, but I would stick to 300. I mean, 
three hundred is 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 more than enough, and I more than three hundred would. Yeah, so the lesser the better, and yeah. uh, so these are the things. And uh, yeah, uh, you can also say that the positioning of the tags, the way you go in. So there are many, many reasons. I mean, there are many reasons for failure. You can't just put it on one. It might be your fault. It might be the patient's fault. It might just be. It might just be the tag that's bad. So so I mean, uh, there, there can be anything that goes wrong. Uh, so I would definitely recommend a proper course before you start putting in the tads uh but then once you exactly know uh, how to place the tads in uh you can't really put your finger to it mostly it's uh, in my cases over here i see a lot of food lodged around the tad and those are the ones which get inflamed and then tend to loosen up yeah uh but the tads uh, these tads are also not the ones which can't be immediately loaded by the way they are they they can be loaded immediately so uh, yeah. tads uh, you don't need to wait uh, for about a week or two so you can just avoid torsional forces don't use any cantilevers which would use forces which would rotate the tad you can use forces which pull and push but not the torsional forces because they will loosen the tad yeah um if you look at reviews on uh, on tad failures you're going to see about 100 causes for failures and just Absolutely. about five reasons for success and you have to uh you have to uh step away from those hundreds possible failures and also uh stick to that five steps of success um yeah uh what one of the factors i want to add in that is the uh um operator's experience uh, there's definitely a learning curve when they're starting to place in the tasks and there's that's like, going to be a lot uh, a big chance for failure but then there's a learning curve to it that you have to be patient about in terms of placing your tad successfully the, the so uh, follow effect. yeah exactly <laughs> um so from dr uh, vikram jit again uh so we should intrude on round wire oh no you should not intrude on a round wire uh intrusion on the round wire is going to cause a lot of uh, lingual and buccal tipping you need to control that a lot that. of botch ups <laughs> yeah so uh, it's yeah. it's it's better to avoid intrusion on a round wire uh, i don't know if you if you mean can you intrude with a round wire in a in a in a uh, mm -hmm. uh, intrusion arch intrusion arches are usually about 1725 uh, uh, tmas mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, i would never do that mm -hmm. um okay so from dr suraj naslapur uh, and Anterior tads sometimes cause depression on the lip. How to avoid that? Anterior tads sometimes cause depression on the lip. Oh, you mean on the back side of the lip? Oh, I, I don't think you can do anything about it. Uh, probably you could just use some wax. Yeah. Uh, that's 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 probably the only thing you can do. Uh, I I I don't have any other way around it. It's gonna reed up anyway after. Mm -hmm. It's something like using a Nans palatal button. and that causing some indentation on the palate palate but it goes off i mean yeah that's that's the side effect of it isn't it yeah but the inter, i mean the indentation on the uh, tongue coming from tpas oh yeah as well i i, I don't see any healing with that oh, you don't see that not much not uh -huh. much no not much healing not much healing mm -hmm. okay so uh yeah uh, do we have any other questions Uh, I believe we don't have any other questions. Okay, so let us uh, get into this uh, interesting case now. Since I've already uh, uh, touched upon the uh, impaction, palatal impactions in my first episode, I'm going to be going into this very interesting case of a central incisor impaction that I have, uh, which uh, which I just got photos of recently. So he's a he's a very young boy, uh, and uh, he has an impacted uh, central incisor. That's two one. so you can you can you can understand the pronounced um, effect psychological effect these cases have on children right bullying and all these things are they very secondary to these things so the patient came in and said that yeah he was bullied a lot and because of uh, his malocclusion and his smile he had a, he had one teeth one one tooth uh, sticking out in the middle of his lips when he smiled so yeah now i'm going to be showing you the botch up over here as well so that so that you understand he had narrow upper arches and he had a uh, narrow lower arches as well he had good amount of crowding on the upper as well as on the lower so what i decided was i would use a rapid uh, palatal expander 
Now you have to be very, very careful when you use these rapid palatal expanders and especially make sure that the child is along with the parent and you make the parent understand exactly what's happening and how to use this. Uh, what, what happened was, uh, what happened was, uh, yeah, uh, this is this is a CT of uh, just showing you uh, where the where the central incisor was placed, and they were rotated as well. So what I did was I expanded the arch. I used a rapid palatal expander, and I gave him the uh, gave him the protocol of one turn a day, but the patient vanished for about six months, and uh, he kept on doing it for, I think, till the. Uh, uh, the screw expanded and then it relapsed and then he was doing it again because there was some kind of a misunderstanding. And now what happened is you can see that I have really overcorrected the expansion to the dot. So you can see the palatal cusps really hanging on the buccal cusps of the lower and they're absolutely tipped. And the worst part is I did not gain any space. I was expecting a huge diastema, which would allow me to get the central incisor down but unfortunately none of that happened. So now I had to take things into control. I placed an open coil spring and uh, these are not, uh, these are just conventional normal MBT brackets. Uh, and I went into a, a, a rectangular wire as soon as possible. Uh, started gaining space over here just with the open coil spring. And uh, as you can see, the side effects of that have been very clear on this lateral incisor. You can see the proclination and the inclination of the lateral incisors or lateral incisors, especially the two, two over here. Uh, once I gained sufficient amount of space, I used, I, start, I went on to a 19 by 25 stainless steel. Uh, I made the uh, step down bends with a small helix over here and uh, uh, placed a lingual button. Uh, exposing the central incisor. I used a closed adoption technique because uh, that's beneficial in such cases to get the gingiva down properly. So after a very long wait with multiple bracket debondings, uh, I think I gather it took me about seven months to get this down because he broke this lingual button here at least three times. And uh, I had to reopen, place it again, place it again, do it. Now, the unfortunate part is I don't have lasers or else it would have made my life very, very easy. Uh, so yeah, anyways, uh, I was able to finally get this tooth down and now comes the main issue. When the tooth came down, uh, the, the, the side effect of such cases are that the root prominence is tremendous. I mean, you will have, uh, you will have a lot of uh, uh, buccal prominence in the roots uh, when they come down as you can see over here the roots are uh, almost out of the bone now i had a i had a decision to make i could either derotate the tooth first and then align and and then let it be so that the root went in again or i would just let it be so i decided to take it uh, take it on and i still continued the derotation of the uh, central incisor uh, derotated it and got the contact now you can see there's a premature contact over here which is which is also making it very mobile. So that scared me a bit, but then, yeah, the next month when I put in the wire, it derotated and the contact was off. I wanted to jump into rectangular wire as soon as possible because I was, uh, I wanted to correct the torque. So luckily the MVT prescription gives you a positive torque on the crown as such, which was beneficial to this case. So I went into a 17 by 25 thermal as far as fast as possible. And now I am on a 19 by 25 stainless steel. As you can see, I have a small space over here. The midline is exactly shifted by about 1.5 millimeters and I have about a 0.1.5 millimeter space over here. I get this here, I should be able to finish this case. I have a small issue with the torque on the lateral incisor here. I probably would be using a Goodman spring or a Warren spring somewhere towards the next month for about a couple of months to correct this torque. Maybe I would just invert this bracket. It all depends on the situation next month. So this is how uh, I've got the central incisor down with a decent amount of uh, vertical control. The good part is you can see that the gums came in pretty well. Uh, I was not expecting the gums to follow, the gingiva to follow as, as well as it has done. I was expecting some kind of a gum surgery, but now I think I wouldn't be doing that. Probably I would just get it down and maybe just modify the one one in accordance with the two one a little bit. Uh, so as you can see, <laughs> the overly wide arch the second this is just immediately post the expansion and then i'm getting it into control uh 
Uh, yeah. Any questions, Dr. Pao, after this? Yep. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, nothing related yet to this case, uh, but we have a few questions here from uh, Dr. Binashri uh, Choudhury in India. Sir, please recommend. Uh, sorry, about that. in India, sir, please recommend any institution where we will do course of that. Uh, uh, I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I have to probably think about it, and I can I can send you a message once I get to know. All right. Uh, from Dr. Marco Gugrich, uh, which diagnostic do you use before closing spaces or first molars? In which cases you think it is it possible? Okay. So uh, if if especially for me, the the answer is very simple. I would at times use a CBCT in order to see the thickness of the alveolar ridge. Uh, if the alveolar ridge is a knife edge, I would anyways be inclined towards not closing the space. But if, if at times I feel that, yeah, the uh, space is uh, good enough, I may sometimes take a follow-up uh, CBCT to see the positioning of the cortical plates and then uh, go in for the protraction. On the uppers, one of the identifying features would be the sinus lining for sure, because uh, it's very difficult to move the teeth through the sinus floor. Uh, that's that's going to be very hard. That's that's going to be hard. So you have to make a decision. Light forces are the key over here. You can protract, but you have to use very light forces. But yeah, these are some of the uh, some of the diagnostic uh, considerations. Uh, the sinus floor, thickness of the uh, uh, the the uh, alveolar ridge itself. I would say that those are the challenges that would uh, um, be in between. Uh, my main challenge would rather be the time that would take for you to close that space and the willingness of the patient. But as far as tissue reaction is concerned, um, right amount of forces could elicit right amount of tissue responses. So um, uh, as long as your teeth are suspended by your periodontal ligaments, I think you would have a high chance to move whatever it is. Absolutely. Okay. Um, from Dr. Suraj Naslapur, how did you do? Uh, how did you correct the tip palatal cusp after expansion? Uh, I didn't do anything much in this particular case. I just used the regular sequence of arch wires. I probably uh, once I go into a once I go into a rectangular wire, I start using the upper and lowers uh, as the same arch wire. I, I don't use the upper arch wire uh, different and the lower arch wire different. I use the same arch wires for both, and I prefer using the lowers. So that already gives me a very constricted arch form. Uh, which helps me with the uh, buckly tipped uh, palatal cusps. Yeah, um, I would like to uh, help you answer um, maybe the mechanics behind that question. Uh, if I can just share my screen. Okay. Do I need to stop? Uh, yeah, for just for a short time. Yeah. I have a similar case that I think everybody would enjoy. Okay. Whoa. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, th this is a uh, part of uh, one of my lectures that's gonna happen here in uh, January, 2021. Uh, but as you can see, uh, um, a part of my collection of cases, this was uh, transferred to me, uh, was consulted to me. Um, and uh, this was the worst case that I saw of an expansion. Oh, what happened? Yeah, okay. Um, so this is the state, uh, sorry, if I may just. So this was the state of the uh, situation. It, this is an undergrad, uh, student's dream of restoring a class one molar uh, without a use of any mouth mirror uh, right, right there. Uh, this case was like the worst case. Uh, it, this patient, um, uh, the story of this patient was uh, she was in a party uh, and then she had an aunt who was a dentist. This patient was around uh, 17 years old. She was wearing a rapid palatal expander uh, with these braces. And for me, I was thinking, well, up to when are you going to stop? And the interesting here, thing here is that the patient was actually very, um, uh, very uh, cooperative with the treatment. She gets her treatments every two weeks. She goes back to the clinic. But then something weird wasn't seen. So uh, I, there was an immediate need of removal. And this is how it looks similar to yours. 
we I sent the patient to a um, to CBCT. My God, for CBCT, I'm going to run this together. <laughs> we see the occlusal surface pretty clear there. <laughs> So it's quite disturbing to see it from this perspective. Um, yeah, and uh, here's another view. And you're seeing the dimensions to this and how, how bad the case actually is, it's quite um, disturbing. I mean, this is, uh, for me, one of the botch ups of all botch ups. <laughs> Sorry to say that, but it actually is. Um, but the question here was, uh, how did you fix it? Um, what I'm trying to do right now with this patient is we're still trying to fix it. And the, the right uh, treatment objective to this patient is going this way. And to, to put it in a way, uh, in, in an analogy, we must uh, think about it as if you're using your uh, your conventional brackets, it's like you're driving manual and you can only go forward. It's, I mean, the easiest way is to go forward. If you're, drive, if you're uh, using your SLDs, then it's like driving on automatic and basically what you're doing is you're, uh, it's easier to drive forward. You can drive backward, but again, it's going to be difficult. And um, the other one would be driving a Tesla. And what I'm saying when you're driving a Tesla is like when you're using your Invisalign. Uh, Invisalign would perhaps be a good option for this, but inserting the, the appliance, I'm not pretty sure how that will happen uh, very easily. So I chose this, um, uh, this approach, uh, use lingual um, um, braces. Uh, I don't like using lingual, uh, but this case I thought was uh, favorable to the force vectors of lingual. And when you're using lingual, basically whatever it is you're using, whether you're driving uh, automatic or um, um, uh, manual, it's just like you're driving in reverse and you really have to look at this patient like you're driving in reverse, like you have to look uh, in the mirror constantly and seeing whether this is uh, going in the right direction. So um, one of the active ways that we can do it is via lingual. Uh, maybe uh, placing a palatal tad could also be uh, a work, um, uh, use. Uh, Intraarch elastic provided that you don't cause uh, unfavorable supra eruption. Um, but it's kind of dangerous in this case. For this one, you really have to put it back into where the alveolar bone is supposed to be. So it's not just pulling it palatal and uh, constrictive, but it's rather planting it back into where it's supposed to be. So for this patient, unfortunately, she was kind of old already. For your patient, he was still young. Maybe that's why uh, there was not any need for an extra effort. But for this patient, he, she definitely needed an extra effort. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's a very interesting case, very interesting case. So, yeah, getting back over here, uh, you see my screen, do you? Yep. Okay, so this is, I'm just going to be giving you all an example of uh, the objectives when you're going to be treating a scissor bite. Now, this is a scissor bite, as you can see, it's 100% scissor bite. Now, as Dr. Pao has already mentioned mm -hmm. in, in, in one of his uh, slides, that there is no other alternative but to raise the bite over here on one side, on the good side, to raise the bite on the opposite in order to intrude and also to buckly tip these, uh, these, these particular teeth, right? So what happens over here is, at this particular stage, is that what, I, what, I've, what I've started doing is I now place an anterior bite plate. I give the patient an anterior bite plate on in scissor bite cases uh, because what they do is they disocclude rather than asymmetrically doing it. Uh, doing it on one side may cause a lot of issues, especially on that side, on the TMJ, uh, compression, etc. Et but if you, if you do it in a balanced way, an anterior bite plate would be the most favorable way. I've, I've tried doing it and I've found very good results. You see, an anterior bite plate over here is able to disseclude the posteriors as well. Uh, now you could increase the bite over here to even much more than this, but it's still balanced. It's a balanced uh, force. And then definitely you would need the buckle shelf implants over here in order to uh, buckly tip and intrude. Now that's the key, intrude. 
because when you buckle your tip, you're going to increase uh, your lingual cusps, uh, the dimension, and it's going to open the bite even further. So this is the mechanics that usually takes place, as you can see over here, is that you place the buckle shelf implant over here, and then you're going to get an intrusive effect as well as a buckle tipping effect, right? So that is uh, very interesting. And that is why you wouldn't want to use uh, an interradicular screw while doing the same thing. You can see the mechanics. An interradicular screw, if used, is going to give you more of a vertical force, which is not going to be correcting the scissor bite, but it's going to give you more of, uh, yeah, a vertical force. But a buckle shelf is going to give you more of a, a transverse uh, force as well, which is going to be very helpful uh, uh, in, in such cases. So that brings us to the topic of occlusal cans. Now, occlusal cans, as we all know, are one of uh, a very, very, very common problems we face in orthodontics. So this is the case, and this is the explanation that I was trying to give in the very beginning. Like I asked the patient to smile, the patient was very conscious, and this is what he gave me. Looking at this, I, I took it on his face while you asked, like, okay, fine, you smile like this, let's go with that. But one fine day during the treatment, I saw him smile like this. And when I saw him smile like this is when I realized that uh, this, this, this is actually creating an occlusal can. This is, this is actually an occlusal can because, uh, and, and you also have a gummy smile as well. Uh, when I saw this, I, 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 I was like, now I have to do something about it because this is a very severe can. As you can see over here, this is uh, this is a, a a macro picture of it, uh, which which would clearly show you the uh, degree of occlusal cant. Now the mechanics is very simple. I'm not going to go again into it as in detail because I've already explained the gummy smile part of it. So this is the occlusal cant. You follow a similar protocol, but you would place the tad exactly where you feel it is extruded. Now you have to choose the side. Of course, in this, in this case, I chose the right side because that is the more favorable side. So I'm going to keep this as my reference. I need to get this up to this level, right? So I leave this side as it is. I place the tads exactly where I felt that the extrusion was more and I started intruding it. Now, uh, side effects are definitely going to be buckle flaring whenever you use such mechanics. Uh, now, I... I have, I have a, a few ways of, of, of uh, correcting them. The one would definitely be a transpandal arch placed over inside to control the buckle inclination of the premolars and the molars. Uh, torquing the wire in a parallel, giving a parallel crown torque to the uppers is not very helpful because that would give you a reciprocal force downward. And you have, you have another moment upward. So it's going to nullify each other. So that's not going to help over there. Uh, I've also found one thing beneficial. If you can place a hook somewhere here and you can run a power chain from the hook under the bracket of the canine, premolar, premolar onto the hook on the molar, that gives you uh, an intrusive vector as well as a palatal uh, uh, push on the crown which prevents the buckle torque, uh, the buckle tipping of the teeth while intrusion. Now, how do you know that you're intruding? If you, you will find an open bite. And the minute you find the open bite, you need to start closing the open bite using elastics. Now, the elastics I've used are very light elastics. They are one by four light elastics, but I have continued the intrusion because I don't want the reciprocal extrusion of the upper segment uh, to nullify the effects of intrusion. And finally, uh, once I was able to extrude the lowers, the cant was corrected. So uh, it's paramount that uh, you, you use very light elastics and continue the intrusion or at least maintain the intrusion while doing so. Uh, now, the side effects in the anterior segment are definitely going to be a proclination of the incisors because as I have mentioned, intrusion demands space. And where is the space? It's, it's all going to be gained by proclination of the incisors. You could use low torque brackets if you're using daemon to avoid something of that sort. But it's basic physics. I mean, you need space. No matter what torque you use, you can't just maintain it and then push back because you need space. Something, if, if, if this material needs space, 
uh, just pushing it or, or or doing anything won't help. It's going to expand if if you're not able to uh, get it surgically. Uh, so, anyways, uh, that's that's the key over here. Now, I would definitely prefer uh, extractions because you can see that I have increased the inclination of the upper and lower incisors in this case. I don't like the inclinations over here, so I would definitely go in for a upper and lower five if given a chance and use minimum anchorage, upright the upper and lower incisors in this case. Uh, incisor retraction is always preferable when it comes to correcting gummy smiles as well because uh, intrusion side effect is proclination, right? Or flaring. And the easiest way to nullify that is having a retractive force. So it's it's win-win when, when it comes to that. Uh, as you can see in this case, I was able to um, correct the cant 100% without the need of any added uh, gingival uh, contouring or any of that sort, of, any, any of uh, adjunctive measures. Uh, yes, there is a way you can measure these. The interlip distance has to be constant. Uh, I've seen posts on Facebook uh, which which show a very animated before smile and a not so animated after smile, claiming they have corrected the gummy smiles. But unfortunately, that is fake. That's false. Uh, you need to have uh, a, a video demonstration, as I've mentioned, because smile is a dynamic process, or at least your interlip distance has to be uh, constant, if not more. Uh, and in this particular case, you will see that I have kept it more. Uh, I've asked the patient to smile even more uh, so that it's a very clear indication that the gummy smile and the cant has been corrected. Uh, as you can see, as I've mentioned, the increase in the proclination of the incisors as a side effect of intrusion and definitely a five extraction would be beneficial in this particular case. So that's about with cants. Excellent case. Uh, did I, did I, okay, I think I stopped sharing my screen. Uh, would you have any follow-up questions on that, Pal? Uh, yeah, uh, from Dr. Vijay Srinivasan, uh, what was the patient's complaint? Dr. Vijay, yeah, the patient's complaint in this particular case was just to align his particular teeth because he had some interdigitation issues. Yeah, okay. Um, from Dr. Jita Elsa, ABP will not cause extrusion of upper molar. One minute, please. One minute. Let me just get back, get my screen back. Yes. Uh, yeah. So what was the question again? ABP will not cause extrusion of upper molar. Anterior bite plate. Uh, anterior bite plate in a very transient phase is not going to cause any extrusion on the upper molars because uh, this particular anterior bite plate in correction of scissor bites are used exclusively for uh, jumping the bite uh, or uprighting the lower molars, right? Yeah. So uh, as, as you can, as you can uh, see that if you, you need space, you eventually need space, right? So the, so the argument is, is almost the same. Uh, I, it's the, the, the force vectors when we use with a buckle shell are definitely going to be faster than the physiological eruption of the upper molars. So that's, that's, what, that's what I'm going to take into consideration while correcting such cases because I need to act fast. And that's the easiest way because the other way would be to just raise the bite on one side. And that is really, uh, I think, tormenting for, for a patient. Oh, I would agree. And it's, not a, it's yeah. not a small bite raise, it's a huge one because scissor bites are like almost like this. And you need a lot of bite raising to get, get, get it to something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, my scissor bite had a huge uh, mandibular rotation um it was in no way a collapse of the bite so whatever i could place will basically mm -hmm. make the patient like she uh make her look like she's yawning if i placed something in Absolutely. the screen it was, it was that bad uh from dr verhel john arcia what if you just use an edgewise brackets on the posteriors and square wire making advantage of wire play to correct first and third order problems i i honestly didn't understand the question. Uh, I think uh, going about without pads and just using uh, um, wires. Ah, okay. Up, uh, for the scissor bites, if, if you're talking about the scissor bites, uh, I don't think it would work, sir, because uh, it's it's not possible to do that. Because to get into a rectangular wire and to use this uh, third order, you would need the arch to be straight, first of all. It's yeah. very, very hard to level the arch itself because 
you have a very strong opposing contact from the upper molars, which is not going to let the lower molars align. And if, right. if you raise the bite, if you raise the bite and if you just possibly use the wires, you would still take a very, very, very long time. And lingually tipped molars are by far the most difficult cases to, uh, to correct if you don't use an auxiliary tag. Mm -hmm. Uh, I swear uh, yeah, I, I, by the way, by the way, I, I have, uh, I think, I think uh, I have a case in which I've used the Schwartz appliance and that's given me good results as well. I was able to expand the lower arch posteriorly, basically just upright them. And the added advantage of using a Schwartz appliance is that it has a posterior bite uh, plate as well, right? You can incorporate that. So that gives you good clearance to upright the lower molars. But then you have to clear the anteriors or else you're going to flare the anteriors and all those things. So it's up to you. Uh, the, the decision is up to you. You can use TADS or you can use an appliance uh, in order to expand the lower. Side effect of using a Schwartz appliance is there is no control on the extrusion of the molars while they are uprighting. Yeah. But using a buckle shelf implants, you're intruding and uprighting. That's yeah. the advantage. I think that's what we're trying to uh, say right now with these vertical dilutions is that, yeah, you mm -hmm. can use whatever you can do to fix whatever is inside the mount. But yeah. then what matters more in the uh, aesthetic part is the mini aesthetics that we really have to consider, um, notably the lower facial thirds or the mini aesthetics. Absolutely. Uh, from Dr. Marco uh, Grugerich, in cases of canting, do you put also other mini screws that are not IZC in movable mucosa? So they do not interfere with roots when intruding. That are not IZZ. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, by the way, this was not an IZZ, uh, IZC. Uh, this was just an uh, this was just an interradicular implant. I just placed it a little higher. I, I usually place the implants a little higher. I'm not very worried much about it because the implants that I use they have really long necks and they don't let the inflammation happen. And even the gums don't really grow about it because of the very smooth and bulbous head. Uh, but there are times where there are tissue overgrowths and the ideal position would be somewhere at the junction of the attached and movable gingiva. Uh, but then, yeah, I, I don't see the needs of placing an IZC for cant correction. It's just about intrusion. You could do that with just a interradicular screw as well. Yeah. Yep, so uh, no further questions. Okay, so that would take me, I think, to the last segment of uh, my case demonstrations, yeah. Now I'm gonna be talking about uh, uh, the club. I'm gonna be talking about some class three, uh, a class three case of mine, uh, in which, uh, which is a combination of how we correct a class three. So uh, we're talking about vertical dimension over here, right? Now, this is a case of uh, uh, the, the profile. And now he's a class three. You can see a very severe class three defect on the left side and not so severe on the right side. You can see an upper midline shift uh, to the left by about four to 4.5 millimeters. And you can see fairly expanded upper and lower arches over here, right? Uh, you, you, would, you would notice that the lower incisors are upright. Uh, now, this is not the favorable kind of class three. Uh, and at the same time, the upper incisors are in an okay uh, angulation. So the objectives of this particular case are, first of all, to correct the open bite, to correct the underbite, to correct the midline shift. Now, how do we do all that? And, and the, by the way, there is a cross bite as well uh, on the left side, right? So what I decided was the first thing I would do is to correct the midline and that in turn would help me proclining the upper a little bit and correcting the underbite. So a class three is never just, uh, uh, you, you can't just correct a class three by retracting the lower dentition. As, as you would see uh, on, 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 on social media, I would, I would be very, very careful while just deciding and saying that, oh, I can correct a seven millimeter class three very easily by just placing those buckle shelf implants and retracting the lower dentition. I'm sorry, but that may not be true. 
so a class three is always going to be a function of upper proclination, lower distillation, and lower tipping of the anterior teeth. You will not always have bodily movement of the anteriors because uh, on the uppers, you have a far more margin, but on the lower, the lingual plate, the labiolingual mm -hmm. cortex is very limited. You can't just, you can't just retract uh, um, uh, more than uh, a certain amount. Yes, there have been claims that uh, in, in, there, are, there have been some certain studies which, which have claimed that when you have retracted and while, while, while the case was uh, finished, uh, there was some amount of dehiscence on the lingual, right? Uh, the roots were a little exposed. But on one year post-retention x-rays and CBCTs, they have shown that the, the bone has uh, remodeled over them. So that shows that with very light forces, you can gain some remodeling even on the lingual cortex. Uh, but in this particular case, as you can see, this is the mechanics. Uh, I have placed an open coil spring on the upper between the two, three and the uh, two, five, sorry, two, four. Now, what this did was this pushed the front teeth to the right, correcting the midline. And also with the distalization, I placed the buckle shelf implants over here, uh, leveled the arches using a 1725 thermal, went into a 1925, placed these two hooks over here, started distalizing. So I was able to correct the canine class, uh, classification over here uh, using the distalization of the lowers as well as the proclination of the upper canines. Now, as you can see, when I started using this case, I did not have uh, prescription brackets. I mean, high torque, low torque. I just had standard torque. Uh, uh, I would definitely want to use high torque brackets on the lowers in this particular case because that would keep the inclination of the lowers in check. But unfortunately, I didn't have that. You could see that I have even uh, inverse. I mean, I inverted the brackets uh, to gain some torque. But unfortunately, Damon just has a plus one or a minus one. So the one degree or a two degree is uh, irrelevant. Even if you invert it, uh, you need a high torque prescription over uh, in, in, in this particular case. Now, what I'm trying to say is everything was corrected. And it's just not a combination of the lower distalization, mind you. It is a combination of upper proclination, lower clockwise rotation of the mandible, and in the end, uh, a little bit of tipping of the lower incisors and distalization as well. Uh, as you can see, over a period of time, I started uh, looking at a lot of uh, gingival thinning, and I could see the root prominence. So I, I, I was, uh, I was uh, inclined to take a CBCT to see whether I exposed the roots or not. Uh, so what I've done is I have uh, taken a CBCT and once I saw this in the CBCT, I decided to take off the brackets in the lower because the, because uh, yeah, the teeth were still inside the bone though, but it was just barely within there. So I didn't want to risk it further and uh, I took off the brackets, but still I had the issue with the cross bite over here. So I decided to use the buckle shelf implants with a lingual button on the upper palatal uh, molar and use the uh, crossbite elastics from there to the buckle shelf itself in order to correct the crossbite. As you can see, I was able to finish this case uh, with decent amount of uh, interdigitation as well as inclination, but I don't like the position of the lower incisors. You see, they're retroclined. I can't do much about it because even if you use a high torque bracket, uh, please try to understand that if you try to close an anterior crossbite or an underbite of about eight millimeters, there is just that much of bone available, right? You can't maintain a positive inclination and just go back. It's not the maxilla. So at one particular point, you will start to start distally tip the lower incisors eventually, whether you like it or not. So even if I would have used, now my, my justification to this is even if I would have used a high talk bracket, I would not have sufficient amount of bone on the lingual to hold the roots. So it's not about just the labial part, it's the lingual as well, right? Uh, so yeah, that's what I did. And as you can see, I was able to correct this underbite to this. It took me about two years and uh, you can see the superimpositions. I have extruded the upper incisors a little bit. Uh, yes, the lowers have tipped and uprighted considerably. I have rotated the uh, occlusal plane and the mandibular plane in a clockwise direction 
which is beneficial for a class three, but which is detrimental to a class two. Now, this is what I'm trying to say. I was very closely monitoring this particular case. I was I was really worried whether uh, I would see some amount of dehiscence because as I as I've quoted in the last uh, extraction versus non-extraction, Hasagawa had a paper very clearly stating that if the bone on the if if there is uh, if if the teeth are not centered in the bone and if the amount of bone is very thin uh, and you end up uh, in that kind of particular kind of an inclination or a proclination uh, which is not ideal there is a 50 percent chance of dehiscence and that's evidence right so i was really worried because 50 percent is a big number and finally i came out uh, uh, i was lucky uh, that in his one year post-op, uh, occlusion was still stable. So that gave me a confidence that, uh, yeah, it's going to stay stable because such cases relapse within the first two months if they had to relapse. But unfortunately, they're good. Any questions, Dr. Pao? None. Okay. So let's uh, move on. Right? Yep. Now now they're coming in. All right. Okay, please. Um, from Dr. Suraj Nathlapur, can these can't be treated with Invisalign? Yeah, of course they could be treated with Invisalign, but I'm not good with good with Invisalign. I've uh, I have a few cases of Invisalign, but I don't prefer using Invisalign. I don't like plastic. Oh. Okay, and a follow up question from the same uh, doctor: Would you extract the liver force in that class three case? Wait, let me go back. Would I extract the lower force in this particular case? Uh, uh, oh, yes. Uh, now, that that gets me to the point. Thank you so much, Dr. Suraj, to, uh, for getting me into this particular point. Now, why I did not extract force is because of this. I'm going to be getting back. I've spoken a lot about this in the past week, and I'm going to speak again about this. Now, this is very, very important. Whenever you're diagnosing a class three and all class threes, you must take a CBCT, must underline the word must. Why? It's because uh, when, if you decide that you would extract the third molars, there is always, uh, you, you, uh, you can't see the x-ray because when you see the x-ray, for example, when you see the OPG, you would think that, oh, I have a lot of space just to the second molars, right? It's very evident. You have a lot of space just to the second molars. And you would think that, of course, this is enough to correct my anterior crossbite. I have about seven millimeters here, and I have about a four millimeter of anterior crossbite. Of course, I, I'm, I'm going to be able to correct this. But that's, that's very far from the truth. Because when you take a CBCT, at the coronal level, you can see that there is, amount, there is good amount of distalization space, and I'm going to be able to move this tooth back, back, back. But the problem over here is, when you go apical, you will see that the distolingual root is contacting the mylohyoid ridge already. Now, this is something in which you cannot displace any further, right? So if you land up in a situation like this, extract force. I would extract force. But if I'm in a situation like this, even if I go down epically and I have enough room to displace, I think I would go in for extraction of AIDS. But if this is not the situation, I would go in for extraction of force. So, good point. Yes. Okay, um, from Dr. Bara Hanna, was the open coil spring enough to correct the upper midline? Absolutely, it was more than enough. I used an open coil spring for about four months that generated enough amount of space um, and uh, it pushed the uppers to the right and also flared them because, of course, there's no space on the right. Uh, so, it has to go forward and and, and, and uh, to the right. So that helped me with the underbite a lot as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, no further questions? Okay. Okay. So that, that will bring me to the last case uh, for today, uh, which is a severe class three. Periodontally compromised case. You can see that uh, in this particular case, she has an open bite. She has she is she is she is a typical surgical case, as you can see uh, the lower lip prominence. You can see the high angled mandible. You can see uh, a periodontal a, a, a very big periodontally compromised dentition. 
uh, wide upper and lower arches, spaced lower dentition as well. No, no history of tongue thrust. This is a typical skeletal open bite. And uh, yeah, missing molars. Uh, missing molars are the icing. You see, they create uh, another kind of headache altogether. And uh, very clear from the uh, OPG over here, you can see that there's less than 50% bone on almost all teeth. And there is about a grade two mobility or grade one mobility in at least most of the teeth. So now how I approach this particular case and how I approach any other periodontally compromised case by itself is by generating or by, by giving very, very light forces. Now, uh, my, my way of doing it was, you see, they, there, was a, there, was, there were a lot of rotations on the lower dentition, right? So uh, I, I usually incorporate these stainless steel wires because an 014 stainless steel with bends are going to give you very, very light forces, controlled forces. So uh, I use the 014 multi-loop on heavily rotated teeth and I use the night eye on the other section to generate very minimum force, very minimal forces because of the, because of the bone. I mean, there was less than 50% bone over here. Uh, there was a crossbite uh, uh, situation on the upper. And so I've used, and, and I, I, I noticed that the occlusal uh, curve of speed was very deep at the premolar area. So intrusion of the premolar area would definitely be beneficial to close the open bite. So that's exactly what I did. I, and, and, and the occlusal, sorry, what do you call this? Uh, the, um, Oral hygiene was really bad. So uh, the, the mini screws were just coming off left, right, and center, but there was no other way around it. So I had to reposition them again and again and still get on with the case. I, I, I just didn't want to waste more time. So uh, every, every time the mini screw popped out, I used to replace them in a different position, but never stop what I'm doing. Uh, that's exactly what, uh, what, what I did. I, I went into a rectangular night eye as fast as possible, con uh, still uh, continuing the intrusion on the posteriors till the time I was able to close the spaces. Now the major issue over here was there was a very big midline shift as well. Uh, so I was, I was lucky enough to consolidate the spaces and uh, generate space on one side where I wanted to shift the midline. And I used a buckle shelf implant over here, elastics, uh, power chains to close the spaces uh, unilaterally. Uh, now, Periodontally compromised cases where the bone levels are very low, right, are very, very prone to clefts, uh, especially uh, these uh, gingival clefts, as, as, as you can see, uh, one is forming already over here somewhere. And uh, over a period of time, when the spaces started to close, you can see I've even changed the mini screw from here to here because this failed again. So I had to place it over here, still continue the retraction. And uh, I, I started giving those very horizontal uh, light class three elastics as well to get the lower in. And uh, finally, uh, with the help of some bends and retractive forces, along with the intrusion still continuing because I don't want to let go of it. Uh, I, I, I didn't want, I didn't want the intrusion to relapse basically. And so I, and finally I was able to get the underbite in control and midline elastics have been placed. Midline elastics are usually used about one by four medium. Uh, but on heavy wires. I don't use them on light wires and uh, because I don't want a cant to form again. Uh, so I keep the wires as stiff as possible. And finally, I was able to get an acceptable result out of a very, very compromised case. Uh, a good root parallelism. And the best part uh, is that I was able to not deteriorate the periodontal condition of the patient. Uh, as you can see over here, there is a, a clockwise rotation of the mandible, which was absolutely unavoidable. Uh, even though I have retracted, I have intruded uh, the premolars. Uh, so the, the issue I think was uh, uh, I intruded the premolars more than the molars. Uh, and that's why you can't, you can't notice the uh, superimpositions on, on this particular case. But a very, the mandible plane is almost maintained. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's changed much in this particular case, but you can see that the periodontal condition is almost the same. I've maintained the periodontal, the bone conditions over here. And this is about one year post retention. You can see the cleft on the lower left side. You can see the cleft very clearly. Uh, that's because of the very low bone levels. Now, uh, I was able to give her a, 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 a better profile uh, is what I would consider the, uh, the lips are in a far better position and harmonious, which 
which is i i wouldn't say that she is still not a surgical case definitely surgery would be the first option for such cases but at least uh, we were able to do this much for her and uh, that is uh, that is what i'm happy about any other uh, any questions with this case dr pao i am not able to hear you you're muted yeah, yeah there we go uh none as of now uh we're we're waiting for some questions uh but this is a very interesting case uh and i think this is one of the things that we were saying that uh and by the, the way the lower facial third by the way this case is again uh, published in uh, apos trends in orthodontics again co-authored by uh, me and uh, dr paolo So you can have a look at this. It's uh, periodontally compromised severe classical class three with open bite corrected by orth orthodontic camouflage using temporary anchorage devices. So you can have a read, and uh, uh, you can you can get to know the mechanics in detail when you have a read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so no questions again so far. Uh, I think this is one of the things where we're saying with the lower uh, mini aesthetics uh, for class three. There's really nothing you can do with the lower facial height, uh, but you can improve on the profile, which uh, you dramatically did, and it was substantial. It would really look good. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, so I, I, I think we have a question by Dr. Suraj Naslapur, and he's like, "How would you approach this case without the multi-loop wire in the lower arch?" Uh, uh, I mean, there are many ways of doing it. Uh, what I would do is uh, I would not. because you have less than 50% bone right you don't want to give those derotating forces very immediately because they are they are too high and uh, they twist the tooth like out usually it's because ortho is always extrusive by nature you you don't want you don't want to you don't want that happen so you you would really want those very 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 light forces uh, over here and i would go in for a sequential repositioning of the brackets i would not place the brackets at the right position i would place them gradually in order to derotate them point by point and finally get them into a good uh, angulation uh, that would be one approach to deliver very light forces because if you just place them at the right position and you really engage the wire in and out with a tight ligature or you might just have the tooth out by next appointment mm -hmm. yeah yeah Are we good? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Uh not as of now. Okay. So, what I would like to what I would like to and and uh, so let's let's conclude. Now uh, basically let's let's conclude uh, our uh, and, and and summarize our lecture for today which has been pretty long actually. It's about three and a half hours. You're so man, I would like brother. so i would like to i would like to summarize your stuff i mean first of all high gingival smile right has to be very very carefully diagnosed uh yeah. you have to take into consideration the vertical rest position while diagnosing the high gingival smile you can't just go by the smile and i'm going to add on my point to it smile is the uh, dynamic procedure and and you need to you need to see videos you can because because i strongly believe that a person does not smile the same way twice he always yeah. smiles in a very different way every time he's asked to smile so you can't quantify that in a very uh, uh generic uh, way um uh, and the most important takeaway from your lecture would be the auto rotation concept auto rotation is going to be handy if you have a premature contact because of a malocclusion or a missing tooth secondary to that and in that case if you intrude the molars you're going to have substantial amount of auto rotation which is beneficial to the correction of your canine relationship and your mandibular position per se but if you're looking for auto rotation in a very perfect class 2 without any uh, secondary issue uh you might not get it right because if there is no premature contact and you try to just intrude the second molars or the first molars you're not going to get any uh rotation because it's already in a harmonious position 
you will then have to possibly consider extractions or uh, growth modulation or uh, surgical aspects of, of, of how things would work. Uh, yeah. And yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the main takeaways I would gather from, from your lecture. Yeah. And um, uh, for your part of uh, your lecture, we, we, what we can take away is the multiple ways that we can uh, uh, approach intrusions or approach uh, different ways to relate the, the mandible to the maxilla. You did a lot of uh, um, auto rotations as well. Uh, mm -hmm. as I would say, um, uh, and also uh, um, changing things from from a, from, a, from a perspective of uh, vertical movements and also creating this um, um, a, a maximum mandibular relationship that would uh, come out not as how we expect it to be. I mean, it, it, it's like you're moving in a different direction, but you're affecting it uh, in, in also a different direction. So there's a lot of techniques, uh, a lot of basic stuff. Uh, one of the um, best takeaways that we can take is that via intrusion, we really have to be intentional on how we should address this, um, primarily through a, a statically determined system. Um, the, the best way that uh, what we can observe with these uh, treatments or mechanics that you showed us is that segmental uh, approaches are one, uh, and also your TAD approaches uh, are another. And also the use of IZCs and buckle shelf implants, um, they are vastly needed, uh, especially in these vertical treatments uh, um, to, to correct uh, a lot of three-dimensional issues within uh, a patient. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Very, very, very true. And uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's about it. I mean, you, there are many ways of, of doing the same thing. Uh, you just have to choose the easiest I mean, I, I go in for the easiest and uh, of course the easiest is not always the best, but, but yes, I mean, easiest is always the number one for me. And then if I find some kind of an issue cropping up, then is when I would go in for the best, but the first is definitely going to be the easiest way for me. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you start to see it potting up, that's when you stop. <laughs> Yeah, and then but, you go but, but it's very important. But it's very important to identify that you've bossed up, right? Yeah. 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 So uh, I think that concludes our session. Um, a very interesting point on uh, what we were established uh, tonight. Really, we were able to. Um, it puts us in positions to think on on how we approach our cases in, in different dimensions. Um, I, I think I said this last time uh, that when you're when you're treating orthodontically, you usually are trapped within the sagittal uh, the sagittal sagittal spectrum, but really uh, transverse um, vertical, especially which was uh, emphasized today, has a huge impact in terms of what sagittal relationships are and uh, and how transverse relationships could be in terms of moving your teeth in a vertical fashion. Um, definitely the movements in the vertical uh, uh, direction is not a simple one. Uh, we did not show a much relative movement uh, or relative mechanics. We showed more of absolute mechanics. Um, I don't think there's any way that you can go about with these cases without these absolute mechanics. And um, I think those are the main takeaways and how all of these things that happen inside the mouth would relate to the mini aesthetics or the lower facial height uh, as we would love to. So um, would you like to add anything to that, Dr. Adam? No, I'm good, I'm good. All right, so thank you everybody for tuning in into this third episode of uh, Botched. Uh, this was uh, the vertical delusions. Uh, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, Dr. Adam is a true Iron Man. He can uh, speak for <laughs> long hours, but a really, really uh, excellent case that I think all of us um, uh, enjoyed uh, and what we can look back into. Um, thank you so much. And, thank you so much, Dr. Papa, for having me again. And uh, thank you. Thank you for substantiating almost everything. And yeah, thank you for teaching me as well. You're my teacher. So the credit goes to you. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we teach each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, stay, stay tuned, uh, like and follow our page. Uh, we we uh, will come up with more episodes of this uh, series, hopefully. 
Um, you can put it in the comment section what we want, what you want us to talk about. Um, and we'll re we're going to try to help you out in uh, whatever way we could.